Commissioner Juliana Jequera, Vice Chairperson, Independent Election Boundary Commission. Ms. Betty Malamba, Program Officer, National Gender and Equality Commission. Dr. Mary Kimari, Assistant Director, Advisor Unit, National Council on the Administration of Justice. Ms. Jackie Muteri, survivor from the 2007-8 post-election violence and the representative of the National Police Service. Thank you all for joining us today here in Nairobi, as well as online, for participants online. First and foremost, I would like to thank Kenya National Human Rights Commission, KHRC, our member organization in Kenya, for organizing this launch event of the report on sexual violence as a political tool during elections in Kenya, state actions needed ahead of the 2022 polls. This joint report is based on two fact-finding missions following the 2017 elections and conducted in July and December 2018 in Migori, Kisumu and Vihiga counties. The team collected testimonies from women survivors from the 2017 elections and their households. Those testimonies have been analyzed in the light of past elections in Kenya in, 20, in 2007, 2008, and 2013, but also with a view to the upcoming elections this year. State and non-state actors were also interviewed for the purpose of this report at local, national, international levels in 2018 and 2019. This has been a long journey since the first missions in 2018 and our organizations would have liked to launch the report earlier, but this was partly delayed by the current pandemic situation, starting in 2020. Last year, in 2021, our organization had the opportunity to present some findings of the report during a conference on women in leadership, achieving an equal future, a COVID-19 world, organized by the Kisumu Gender Working Group in Kisumu County. The report shows patterns of sexual violence during election times in Kenya, but also its consequences, especially on survivors and their family, which have a broader impact on the Kenyan society at large. The report shows also the impunity for perpetrators. This report also provides a risk assessment in view of the upcoming 2022 elections and presents a series of recommendations aimed at preventing any resurgence of election-related sexual violence. Ultimately, I would like to thank all those who contributed to this report with the support from FIDH main donor, which is the French Development Agency, the FAD. On behalf of FIDH, the International Federation for Human Rights, I am pleased to officially open this event and I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Julia, for that uh, wonderful uh, opening remarks. Uh, we will now move to the next item, which is context setting. Uh, this, is, uh, this will be done by Davis Malombe. Davis Malombe is the executive director of uh, Kenya Human Rights uh, Commission. He's been in this struggle for a long time. He's uh, been part of so many elections previously, and so... Right now, as we know, as the county is um, uh, uh, gearing up for the upcoming general election, so much is happening, right? So many things are happening, but within this context, he will be able to give us uh, details of what he thinks uh, we need to know or understand, even as we plan for the next uh, coming elections and also in our different uh, um, assignments to just ensure that we deliver within the existing situations. Welcome, Davis. I wish to take this opportunity to welcome all of us in this event, which uh, we are treating as a conversation about uh, what happened in, uh, in two, 2017 and then what it means in the current context, which uh, we are facing right now. So it's going to be a political conversation uh, about uh, uh, political ability, 
uh, and also political violence, and which also ends up with a lot of uh, gender-based violence. So just say Kenya Human Rights Commission uh, is a, a premier non-governmental organization which has been working on elections from 1992. So every year from 1992, we have been running many interventions around elections. And um, we are also members of the International Federation. We are proud members of the International Federation on Human Rights, who we have also been working together uh, to deal with the, the state of human rights in the country. So I just want to say a few things. Um, of course, we know elections are critical human rights components. And that's why when you look at the Bill of Rights, uh, election is put as part of the uh, Bill of Rights. So it's one of the most fundamental civil and political rights. And in terms of governance, it's also a process which then enables us to establish uh, power. And that is the main reason why there's been a lot of contestation. So I think because of the political infrastructure of our state, uh, we have seen elections which are extremely uh, contested and also unnecessarily, unnecessarily competitive. And a part of this is also because of the system we have, which gives us what we call the winner's take all uh, electoral outcome. So which means then, if certain constituencies or parties don't win, they feel like they, they will have lost for the next five years. So that is part of, of the reason, therefore, we have elections which are violent, contested, and this is the contest in which uh, we are moving uh, towards the August uh, 9th, uh, 2022 elections. And therefore, that therefore leads to a lot of violence, and that violence is also manifested in SGBV. So if you look at from 1992, that has been the pattern. And what is happening right now is extremely worrying. Just for the last two weeks, you can see the country is uh, in a serious mess, starting with fights in the National Assembly when members of parliament were discussing the political party's uh, bill. Uh, you saw uh, uh, the Liduri issue, and uh, you have seen on Sunday what happened at Jacaranda uh, grounds uh, in Kayole, which, of course, uh, we, we also want to take this opportunity to, to, to condemn and ask Kenyans to resist uh, from this kind of culture because uh, we can't move towards to, uh, our elections with this kind of scenario. Um, and of course, now part of what has deepened this problem is uh, impunity in the country where there's no accountability for the actors who are also involved in this kind of acts. And therefore, and that's why we have this title of the report, uh, when there's a lot of violence, there's, there's a lot of manifestation of SGBV, which in most cases is used as a tool of suppression. And in most cases, actually, we don't end up documenting SGBV the, the way it is supposed to, and also respond to it the way it is supposed to, to in the context of election. So we tend to generalize eh, political violence. So because most of us are used to monitoring uh, elections and also what comes with it. So you find we end up documenting assault, bodily harm, all those kinds of generalized acts of violence. But we don't find time to narrow down to SGBV and therefore follow through that. So that element of lack of, of accountability for people who commit these acts from 1992 is part of what we need to deal with. These issues eh, are not just matters for integration and cohesion, are serious questions of justice and accountability. And the time we don't take that serious, eh, uh, we would be able to resolve this. So now, this monitoring, we did it between July and uh, December uh, 2018. Um, and we target, of course, three counties, Vega, uh, uh, and Exuma counties. And most of this is actually during the repeat presidential election. Eh? And you can remember the context between uh, Jubilee and also ODM. So part of the findings, I'd, I know we'll get to that, is uh, there were serious acts of rape and other forms of violence against women. Um, of course, there was uh, gang rape. 
And there was also, most of the people who were targeted were poor people within those regions. So there's also a class dimension to all this. And uh, the alleged perpetrators are also police officers, because most of the victims complained that the people who raped them were in also junk green, in junk green uniform. Uh, so we are saying alleged, because uh, a lot of investigation need to happen around with this. Uh, and to me, one of the, the most unfortunate thing is the systems had broken down so much to the extent that you can't even have enough uh, evidence which we can even use to push for rem remedies for the victims who have also suffered so much. So if you go, because I was in Vega during the Pakistan mission, which was led by Madam Mia Sabania, you'll find the police desks were not available. So women could not re report anywhere, imagine anywhere. And then the other facilities, that time nurses were also on strike. Eh? So th there was also no opportunity for them also to, to seek medical support from the healthcare facilities in those regions. Now you can see that kind of context. Just to show that these kind of situations sometimes they are also very much well planned. Eh? And uh, I'm speaking to the internal affairs unit. I think we need to find ways of getting into the depth of these kind of situations, especially all the actors who are working on, on elections from the government side of things, because we have also so many representations here from the government and also from the civil society. This kind of violence is so well coordinated uh, between the state and the state actors who commit it. There's a report KJC did of 1992 and 1997 called uh, Killing the Thought, State Sponsored Violence. And a part of the strategy was called informal repression, where you use uh, individuals like warriors and then you give them uh, security informs and equipment to commit violence. So this is the kind of mess we are dealing with. And uh, we have gone through what we are calling anti check at the BBI, and uh, there has never been a discussion about, yeah, just discussing what Kenyans and also victims went through. So I think also this culture of selective amnesia and moving forward in the name of peace and cohesion, it's also a notion of governance we need to challenge. We need to challenge this notion of peace at all costs without going into the depth of discussing accountability and the justice around the situations which led into this. So that's why people nowadays don't care. Yeah, you can incite, you can do all manner of things. So I think this is also part of things we need to deal with as a country. So generally, the people we spoke to, they went through so much mess. Uh, emotionally, uh, socially. In fact, we met so many victims who were already going through separation within their families. Um, emotional because of, of, a, of kind of uh, distress and the trauma. I remember it was so, so much such that one of our colleagues said she's not going to call her husband for the next one week. It was that bad. And of course, we accompany that with also psychosocial support to ensure that people are also able to to overcome that, and of course, a lot of economic laws, eh, because a big number of women were also targeted within the areas where they were doing business, like in FIGA. So they, have, they also lost a lot of uh, part of that business, and also political laws. Most of the victims to IBC, they told us eh, they were not going to participate in the next election if this is the cost they have to pay. It is too much to be part of that process. So I think this could also part of the things which is also make people a bit dis disinterested in also uh, participating in, in elections. They said they are not going to participate in those regions because they have suffered so much in the name of enabling people to get into public offices. So some of the things I would like to, to propose as uh, moving forward and also just given the current context, um, and I'm, I know Betty would speak to this, eh? we just need to have a proper uh, early warning and monitoring system across the board, among all the state actors and also civil society actors here. Be able to identify the hotspot properly and also be able to monitor and document and respond immediately, effectively. Especially, I'm putting on the spot Kenya Marais Commission from the civil society. Uh, crew is here on gender violence. Uh, Desi, Crown Trust, uh, ILOG is here. All the civil society actors, please, uh, let's find a way of documenting all this kind of violence, especially around human rights violation, SGBV, 
and also security injustice, of course, together with IPOA and also Idano Affairs Unit, and also therefore be able to cut out a timely, independent, and effective investigations and prosecution as a form of deterrence. I remember on the ICC case, eh, uh, it was a lesson. I remember some of the guys who were acquitted, what they were saying, uh, they would wish to be part of that kind of, of exposure again. So we, we need to put our political class at that level where they fear accountability. But right now, ability is what is thriving. So we need to find a way of monitoring and responding together across the board. And of course, activation of gender desks within all the police stations. And uh, uh, this can, can be done through uh, the police service and also through, through GEC and uh, other actors. That is, that is also required. So that when these kind of things happen to our women, there's also ways of uh, providing them with the legal support and other kinds of remedy and documentation. And of course, create uh, facilities within our healthcare systems across the country to ensure that women are also able uh, to also report on time and also get support. I remember one of the biggest problems we found in our monitoring was uh, pre-exposure to HIV AIDS. Actually, I think from our analysis, there was a, actually a deliberate attempt to infect with women with HIV. Yeah, so just access to those facilities on a day-to-day -day basis is important so that when there's a crisis, then it, it becomes part of the spaces where uh, our people can be able to, to get support. I know, Jada, I was speaking to another lady who told me there's, a, there's, a, there's an initiative which is about to be connected by the Minister of Health around these kind of things in the Ministry of uh, Initiative. So I think we need to find ways of dealing with it. Health it has now become a major component of electoral justice, something we have been taking for granted. So when we are even talking about take orders on elections, we also need to be talking about the Ministry of Health because it is what plays a big role when people are violated. Uh, the other recommendation I want to put on the table is, uh, and this is to Ethics Commission and IBC, I think we need to find ways of uh, exp uh, exposing, barring and restricting criminals who are also involved in this kind of violence so that maybe they can stop from even vying for public offices. Because there has to be a price. And I know one of the biggest prices politicians avoid is being uh, limited from accessing public office and power. Sinequally. So if they get to know that this kind of behavior is going to limit the access, I'm sure they are going to restrain themselves. So we need to have that kind of an arrangement where perpetrators are out to account, but they're also challenged and stopped from uh, uh, access to public office. KJC would be keen to even take some of these cases to court in partnership with other actors. Because without this, we are not going to stop this kind of, of impunity. Actually, people feel so entitled to commit these kind of things in the country. Um, the other aspect is uh, what has been emerging, the multi agency committee coordinated by the, by the, by the interior and the judiciary. So I think that is also other space, together with the National Council, all the administration of justice, which we are part of, NCAJ also, has been a provided space where we also discuss electoral preparedness. And uh, our suggestion is also, because there has also been this discussion, that uh, judiciary considers uh, giving this kind of mandate to the chief registrar of judiciary, because the chief justice cannot be the chair, because there are so many cases which will go to court, and which then the chief justice would be required to, to preside over. So that is also other space which we also need to safeguard, because NCIJ is also a space where we also discuss policy issues about emerging governance issues. So that is also other space we need to take advantage of so that there's also more response to, to these kind of issues. Um, the other issue is, uh, I think we are going to towards party primaries very soon. It's supposed to be in April. And now we are going there in this kind of escalated uh, tension. Eh? So we need to start now uh, holding people to account so that by the time we get there, because now primaries are also mean elections, meaning general elections in other regions like uh, in Nyanza, Central, Okabane, and Lift Valley. So people now see that is also at a space where they have to win at all means. So I think together with IBC, we need to find ways of having, ensure that there's going to be minimum violence, because actually that's going to be 
that it must test about what we are going to expect in August. So primaries should be the space where we test accountability on electoral violence. Yes, so we need to be prepared. No, because now we have like three months to go. Guys, ELOG and others, eh? primaries is going to be our testing ground to see what happens. And then finally, uh, because it has been hard to also get evidence, I think there should be a way of giving uh, remedies to the victims. Um, and of course, continued psychosocial support because of the suffering they have gone through. I think we also need to find ways of providing them psychosocial support. Uh, of course, economic support. And of course, as provided in the basic principles on the right, uh, on the right to remedy for victims of gross, human, uh, gross violation of human rights and uh, international humanitarian law, we need to assure Ken Kenyans a guarantee of non-repetition. And that only comes when there's accountability for these kinds of injustices. I just want to say, uh, right now things are not good. There's, there's a big contestation at national level. If you look at governorship in the country, uh, there's a lot of competition and interest. When you go to the women rep, senatorial seat, uh, MCA, there's going to be so, I think, <laughs> so we might actually experience more violence at all levels, which then makes, makes it difficult for even us to respond. So we need to start also mapping the country along that situation. The other cases we are dealing with are issued mainly caused by the, by the national conversation and conversation. Now it's going to be more devolved. See, that's true. Yeah, there's going to be more contestation beyond the national. Because where I come from, I see like we have like over 20 candidates who won the MCA seat, and all of them are very vicious. Governorship in Kitui, we have Bigogo who won that seat. You have seen also Kirinyaga, what is happening. So we need to start also preparing scenarios so that when it comes to response to violence and also electoral accountability, we are more and more prepared. So with those uh, few remarks, I want to wish us a very insightful and honest political conversation around this agenda. Thank you. Okay. Asante ni sana. Ntajaribu kuzungumza kwa lugha ya kiswahili na pia kwa lugha ya kiingereza kwa sababu tuko na dada zetu na ndugu zetu ambao kidogo wanafuata sana kwa lugha ya kiswahili. Uh, my name is Irene Soila from the Kenya Human Rights Commission. And I start by narrating a story of one Lucy. Lucy, not her real name, was born and brought up in Homer Bay County. Lucy also got married in Homer Bay County. But then Lucy got a wind of available opportunities in Migori County for business. So Lucy and her family left Homer Bay County to Migori County to start some form of businesses to cater for their families. Lucy and her husband were not the well, very uh, spoken family, but our quiet family, but led a good life anyway. Lucy was running a small business, a small scale business in Migori County. And in 2017, Lucy had stayed in Migori County for 30 years. She voted in Migori County. So on 27th of October, 2017, Lucy went out with her husband for their usual business. Lucy used to run her business along the road of Migori, uh, is it, is it? Uh, along the road, the main road of Migori County that connects us to Tanzania. She sold Viberiti, Sweetie, um, Big G, Bolga, that kind of good business that gave her food for even her children. But on 27th, she woke up and went for her business. At around three, something happened. And everyone was running around. She got confused. What is it? And before she knew it, she was also running like any other person. She left her items behind. 
and ran for her life. When she looked back, she saw people following her. And she kept running, and running very fast. And where Lucy used to stay was somewhere at the hill. And for her to access that home, she would pass through a forest, which she did successfully. But before she could open her door, people were already with her. She tried closing behind her, but they were already here, and they stormed in. Trying to ask, what is it? She was slapped, and she fell on a couch. And so the first man told her, strip, or I strip you. Of course, you can't strip yourself. And so she was stripped. But the second man raped her. Before anything else happened, before she could even take, I mean, uh, rescue herself, trying to, trying to ask what is happening, the second man was on her again and raped her. Lucy looked at, I mean, a, a, what, a history, something that was happening. She couldn't understand what was happening. And when the second person was done, the third person went in. And when that happened to a 54-year-old, she passed out. The third person finished the business that he was doing. And probably the fourth person, because at the time of documenting is, Lucy did not know whether the fourth person also raped her. All what she knows, when the first, third person went in, she passed out. And so she was left at the coach, sleeping helplessly. And when she woke up at around six, the person she saw be beside her was the husband. So the husband came, because he also ran for his life when things were happening. So when he came, he found a, an unconscious woman. He waited. He didn't know what, how to help. So he waited. And when she woke up, the husband said, she didn't talk. She didn't answer back. She just kept quiet. She tried to recollect herself. She tried to wake up. A 54-year-old who had been raped by a young man. She was supported by the husband anyway. And she went direct to her bed. She didn't shower, she didn't even eat, but she went to her bed and slept. The husband on the other side didn't know what to do. And so after two days, the husband could not take any more. He didn't know what to tell her. So he took his bag and left for Homa Bay, leaving a sick woman in bed. So the husband left, and Lucy was left alone. Anyway, by God's grace, Lucy woke up. She used salt, that's what she told me, and hot water, warm water, to try and clean herself, hoping that things will work out. So when the husband went to Homa Bay, the only thing he used to do was to call her, that's all what he could do. He's not that person who shouts. He's not that person who speaks about anything. He was dying inside. He kept the issue to himself. So Lucy, while trying to recover, trying to understand what really was happening, after a few months, Lucy was told the husband has passed on. So the husband passed on, 
because he couldn't take it. He did not imagine what to do with a wife that was raped. He died of depression. So Lucy went to bury the husband and came back to Mikuri to try again and see whether she can recover for herself and also her businesses to continue with life anyway. So when I went to Migori, I met Lucy. And Lucy told me, you know what? He passed on. I spoke to Lucy and told her, Lucy, you have to wake up. You have to know that there's no any other way. And indeed, you have to recover. And she promised to recover. She promised to walk again. She promised to smile again. And so when I left Migori, I knew Lucy was going to be fine, among many other ladies who may not be here, but at least we were interacting. And when I went back again, I met Lucy, and we were having a discussion with the women. How are we doing? How is life? How is, what is happening? Blah, 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 many things. So Lucy called me on the side and told me, you know what? I got sick. And I was like, I really know what it is, but I don't want to say. Because, I mean, how do you take that? I told her, Lucy, go, to, go and see a doctor. You will be fine. She told me, I know you don't understand. I got HIV. A 54-year-old who got HIV. And the husband died. And so... I recollected and told Lucy, you can still, you are alive and you will live to tell the story. I beg of you, please seek medical attention. Please see any doctor. If you need my assistance, I'm available. But please, Lucy, you promised me you will smile again. Please let's keep that promise. And she smiled. And I told her, if you want us to get a doctor away from Megori, I would source around. You can go to a hospital, public hospitals provide medicine, medication for this kind of uh, HIV prevention and everything. So you will get. But then Lucy, I don't know, along the way, Lucy could not handle. Lucy did not survive. Lucy passed on. Lucy passed on. Lucy passed on. Lucy passed on because you were not there. Lucy passed on because the system did not take care of a woman. Lucy passed on because violence must happen for someone to win. Lucy passed on because we must win by all manner of means, even if it means to kill, we will kill to win. Is that what we want for the next generation? I am speaking for Lucy because she's no longer there to speak for herself. But if this case can be able to support someone, support a woman to never go through what Lucy went through, then so be it. Ladies and gentlemen, Lucy was buried in Migori County. And her family went just like that. And that is the end of my story. Thank you. I want to take you through the, the, the findings of the reports and the conclusions. Before then, I want to appreciate the women who helped us take, uh, take uh, document their stories and be able to come up with this report. It takes courage to tell someone else what you went through. So thank you very much. And we'll continue working with you the journey because it is important that women must be able to support fellow women. Uh, the title of our report is Sexual Violence as a Political Tool during elections in Kenya. 
then state actions needed ahead of 2022 elections. That is the title of the report. Um, we go and delve into the presentation outlines. Uh, what is in our report? Sexual and gender-based violence, a major component of political violence in Kenya. We also, uh, uh, the, the report also tries to answer the question, can a repeat of election-related sexual and gender-based violence be avoided in 2022? And then in our report, we'll find conclusions and recommendations to various departments and agencies. So information gathering, how did we get this, or how did we get a wind of these cases? So the Kenya Human Rights Commission, another 30 organizations um, uh, what monitor elections in Kenya, and as a result of monitoring, it's when we got uh, to know that there was violence against human, uh, I mean, there were violence generally. But this particular violence against our sexual violence was, was also meted on various Kenyans in the country, and especially in various parts of the country that was opposition areas. And so as a human rights violation, and the need for us to highlight these issues, we went to various areas of the country, and in particular hotspots areas that we chose to, were Vihiga, Migori, and Kisumu County. So you will find in our report our um, testimonies from Migori, uh, Vihiga, and also Kisumu counties specifically. This is not to say that there were no violence in other parts of the country, but we are complimenting because there are many other organizations that were also uh, documenting these issues. From the start, maybe to say this, we started the conversations around documentation of violence against women uh, way back immediately after this came to us with various organizations, which included CRU, um, Wangkanja Foundation, Kenya National Commission, uh, we had ICJ then, we had PHR, and many other human rights organizations. So those were the first partners we started with, uh, documentation. And we did the first documentation in Nairobi County that were, was well captured in Kenya National Commission reports. So why the target counties of Kisumu and Migori were chosen mainly because of the three counties were perceived as opposition strongholds and were also mad with violence during previous elections. And it is also because we got that information from our human rights monitors and the need for us to have taken action after that uh, information came to uh, our desk. The Higa County was unprecedented and unexpected, hence survivors of sexual violence did not access much needed support. I mentioned that um, the Higa was not really very a uh, hotspot area then, but it only emerged that uh, a, 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 what, an issue happened that also escalated to violence. And so we went into those counties having understood what really was happening um, and the violence that were, you know, um, affecting women in particular. So we did fact-finding missions, one that really solely uh, dealt with documentation of women who were then victims of uh, gender-based violence, but also we realized there was need for us to look at it from a household point of view. It is not enough to imagine that uh, you have information just by listening to the, to the survivor himself or herself, but also what is the issue or what is the extent to which violence also affect a uh, house uh, of these particular survivors. So we did the first documentation of the women and also together with the survivors after. We also had an opportunity to speak to 13 states across the, the three counties and they gave their interviews around what was happening. So you'll realize that in our report we have those findings from the key, from the, the chiefs, from the police uh, on the ground, uh, what exactly was happening in those areas and the dynamics that took place and what really triggered the violence. So you have all that information in our report 
we undertook an in-depth desktop research on various reports and articles relating to systemic violence against women in elections. This you'll find in our report that we have spoken much about the 2007 uh, post-election violence, the 2013 and also 2017, what um, the report has really factored more on. And also, on our key findings, a total number of 79 women with an average age of 45 were interviewed. Their testimonies confirmed that SGBV was perpetrated on a massive scale in opposition strongholds. And so what that means is that in every uh, election where there's an opposition uh, area, you're likely to face or see violence in those areas. Uh, the main perpetrators of this violence, as per the questions and the, the confirmation from the victims, were police or men in uniform. So during the 2017 election, I mean uh, violence, we can confirm through our survivors that the perpetrators, the main perpetrators, were police or men in uniform. Violence was committed as part of a crackdown by security forces on protest denouncing the results of the presidential elections. So during the protest, it is at that point that also um, perpetrators took advantage because then there is confrontation and conflict across. So that is when they got a, a, a good time to also be able to do what they did best. Most of the survivors interviewed had not filed complaints. When we interviewed the survivors, most of the reasons why they were not able to file complaints is because already the claim was that the police officers were the perpetrators. So if you go file a complaint to a police officer, then it means there will be no action because you are filing a complaint against an, a, a fellow uh, colleague. And for those who tried to do so, they were also faced with a lot of backlash and also just rude um, police officers who could not listen to them. Some, and, and especially in Kisumu, I remember, there was a case where our lady went to report this case. And she was told, and I quote, Unafikiria utapeleka wapi hii kesi? Nitakupatia obi, lakini utashinda tu kituzunguka zunguka hapa kila wakati. So clearly, there was no goodwill to receive these cases from the police uh, officers and also the departments. Most of the survivors interviewed indicated that they had been raped during the pre repeat presidential elections. That is between 26th and 27th of October is when mass, mass, mass violations took place. So our report has also emphasized to make sure that the repeat, pre or to just um, highlight how the repeat presidential election was a very, um, the, the environment was very hostile and that people could not freely participate in the electoral process. Sorry. So um, another finding in our report is that rape, in particular gang rape, was the most common form of sexual violence. Listening to my story right now, Lucy was raped by at least three men. She did not know whether the fourth man, the fourth man also raped her. So what we, have, what we found in our report is that most of the cases were gang rapes. Survivors were mostly women from poor economic backgrounds. Yeah. So what does that mean? First, one of the things that we were very um, key to note was that most of these women who were raped were in their usual businesses, meaning they are business women, although on small scale. You also realize that in times of conflict, because we are um, or we live uh, probably a uh, $1 a day, we must go to business because someone somewhere must be feed their children. So it is in these uh, scenarios that you find, because we must also be able to continue with our, uh, with our um, 
usual work or what we do to make sure that we feed our families, then we are caught up in this violence. Uh, despite concordant elements um, documented by multiple stakeholders, Kenyan authorities continue to fail to implement survivors' rights to justice and reparation. From the history of 2007 to date in 2017, our report has shown or has tried to highlight the non-commitments to, um, to address issues of violence uh, by the authorities in charge. So it is key that we realize that there is need for authorities to take action when this happens. Most of the survivors were raped without protection. I think in our report it is only one person in particular who mentioned that the perpetrator used a condom. In fact, one of the perpetrators, uh, I mean, one, one of the survivors, when the, um, when, when the perpetrator was actually trying to do, I mean, to rape her, she told, she told him, Mimi yata niko na ukimwe. Then he called someone, Kamau, ndio huyu mwanzako hapa, endelea. You know? So it means it was not even a problem. It is until, and the, and, and the woman said, no, 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 tafadhali basi. Wacha basi tu, wacha basi tu wewe fanya. You know, like it, it reached to a point you are now negotiating. You do it instead of him. Kwa hivyo wewe ulikuwa mjinga kiasi hiu na tudanganya, you know? And they did it. We have various recommendations. And they have been given for thematic areas. A recommendation for prevention, recommendation for protection, recommendation for investigation and prosecution, remedy and reparation. The Kenyan government should make amendments to the Sexual Offenses Act to acknowledge and address the unique circumstances of sexual violence committed during crisis or conflict situations. In particular, to alter the evid evidentiary threshold for the prosecution of such offenses. I know our Sexual Offenses Act is still a bill. For those who are following, it's still a bill. So we must inform that to make sure that it is uniquely going to address sexual violence in conflict. And also it can go beyond conflict and also have the pandemic perspective also. Because we realized during the, um, the COVID-19, sexual and gender-based violence was very, very uh, key uh, when it comes to um, addressing uh, issues of COVID-19 and how that really manifested was key to note. The Kenyan government should ensure greater coordination between the national and county levels of government in the elimination of SGBV to guarantee that interventions are localized and have a direct positive impact on survivors of sexual violence. Now let me tell you, in Migori County in particular, and I won't mention the, the victim for purposes of her protection. She, she was raped by three, I think three, um, three perpetrators. This particular survivor has a brother or a sister who works as a police officer. So when this happened, they went with the husband to see the brother to just try and see how can you advise. Are you able to identify these people? They are from your, I mean, your forces, your fellow colleagues. Are you able to identify? When they went, um, the brother told them, the couple, that ata mimi, tulishindwa, hawa watu wametolewa wapi. Ni kama ata atu kwa tunaelezwa, wanakuja kufanya kazi gani. Kwa hivyo mimi kama ndugu yenu nitawambia, ende ni tu hospitali, mutibiwe, ili msipate ugonjwa kwa sababu hata sisi tume, tumeshindwa kabisa kuelewa na hawa watu hata hatuwaele hatuwajui so that was the response of a police officer who is based in one of the places that we interviewed for purposes of protecting the survivor so you can imagine there is no coordination on the other side with the national government they just deploy people go without necessarily no, uh, probably uh, caring to understand how can we be able to complement instead of just going to take up action. Yeah. So 
that is what uh, that is, uh, prevention is trying to address. The Kenyan government should take all necessary and appropriate measures to address the root cause of election-related SGBV, including by focusing on prevalence and misogyny and patriarchy within the political sphere. This is simply to say, Wamama lazima muamuke. You must go for political seats. Because the moment we also have women, we probably, in my thinking, we will be able to protect our fellow women. From where I sit, if we have women in the political sphere, then it means we will also have gender balance that will not be overwhelmed by the patriarchy. I am sorry for the men who are here, but it happened, we must be able to address. County governments should enhance prevention mechanisms by activating and coordinating key departments in readiness to prevent and respond to cases of election-related SGPV. What that is trying to address is that when we went in particular to document, we realized that most of the counties were not even ready for these kind of issues. They were not prepared to receive them. And it also became more dire because at this time, uh, public health officials were already on strike. So it became a disaster and another disaster. So how do we make sure that we are prepared in the event our counties are mentioned at, as hotspots? What does it mean in terms of preparation? It does not mean because it is a hotspot. We now send all our uh, troops to Migori because it is a hotspot without thinking what else, what next, what would happen in that situation. And then we have Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, IPOA and GEC, in collaboration with civil society organizations, should raise public awareness on election related SGBV with a view to establish local level systems for early warning as well as monitoring and documentation of incidents when they occur. What you're simply saying is that everyone should do their work. Let's do our work during these very volatile situations, during these very um, needy situa times, because it is the time that we are needed the most as agencies. Please let's do our work to make sure that if nothing else, we can at least be able to respond to these issues. Also, the Kenyan government should guarantee the working capacity for these independent institutions. That is the um, Kenya National Commission GEC, IPOA, um, uh, Internal Affairs Unit of the National Police and the ODPP, and ensure they have adequate resources as critical institutions in providing effective remedies. The moment you continue suppressing uh, independent institutions, it simply means you are also compromising the rights and the prevention of this kind of situations. So we must ensure, or the government must ensure, that during these very volatile, very needed situation or times, these institutions are well resourced to help them deliver on their job. It is not enough to tell them you have a job, without resources. You must have resources for you to work. The Kenyan government should ensure a human rights-based approach to law enforcement during elections and issue guidelines on the protection of women and girls, including in education institutions. What does that mean? That our constitution, the longest article in our constitution is which is the longest article in our constitution? Can you all hear me? The Bill of Human Rights, right? It has very many components and protection. If we can be able to, to implement the Bill of Human Rights, you will always be able to approach issues from a human rights-centered uh, perspective. The moment you deploy without necessarily looking at what have you deployed for them to go and do, without even limiting what they can be able to do, then you are violating the rights of Kenyans. 
who are looking up to you to support them. The Kenyan government should guarantee its national, regional, and international obligations to protect and promote women's political rights. Wamama tunahaki hatunahaki. Si tunahaki pia sisi. Tunahaki ya kupiga kura, tunahaki ya kuchaguliwa, na tunahaki ya kuchagua yule ambaye sisi tunayemtaka. Ni kwa sababu ya kuchagua yule ambaye tunayemtaka ndio maana tunanyanyaswa. Mama mmoja aliniambia pale vihiga, yeye alikuwa wa Jubilee. And because she's a supporter of Jubilee, she was open about being that supporter. So when these um, conflicts arose, aliambiwa kwanza wewe tunakujua. Umekuwa pale kila saa, kila saa nani, kila saa we nani. And she was raped. Just because of supporting whoever you want, because of being open about it, she was raped. Mama mmoja pale nalo kakaniambia ya kuwa, mimi nipatia ni nipige ruzi, hata sita panga laini, wacha nikimbia nipige kura yangu, nitoke kabla mze wangu haja toka. Manake ya kikuja ajue nilipiga kura na nikapigia mtu fulani, leo nitauawa. So she was to be given a chance to vote and run away before the husband could know that she came to vote for a particular individual who was not needed in that area. Just because you're a woman, you can't even make a decision. We must say no. Wamama tutasema no. Wacha tuseme wapana. Na tuseme tumekata. Sivo. There are many uh, um, recommendations. Please bear with me. The Kenyan government should share the deployment plan operations order of security and defense forces and services, including the chain of command with Kenya National Commission and other relevant actors in advance in order to ensure transparency and accountability. We struggled, other than I think Migori, where we got the list of deployments, the rest of the areas it was not easy to get. And when we asked whether Kenya National was given this information, they didn't have. So we need them to have this information so that they can also be able to uh, hold people accountable for the violation of human rights. Uh, the other one, the Kenyan government should sustain a periodic vetting process of law enforcement agents and other security forces and services with a view of ensuring that those fa found culpable of sexual violence are also um, prosecuted and removed from service. It is very important to take a, a responsibility of your own actions. The moment you are given um, a clean bill of health, then be sure, even in 2022, you will still do it. Kwani nini? Wali nini in 2017? So, after 2022, bado nitafa? Because the, the government has allowed. So they must take responsibility to make sure that those people are also held um, accountable. I can go to investigation and prosecution as well as the other thematic area and just maybe scan a few. The Kenyan government should enhance resourcing and up upgrading of gender violence recovery centers at the national and county levels as well as probability, pro properly instituting gender desks at all police stations in the country. Wakati kuna mama mmoja alikuwa ameenda kutafuta gender desk vihiga. Juni vihiga. Akaambiwa hiyo imefungwa mpaka elections imalizike. Yeah. Hakuna hiyo kazi hata alimpigia simu kwa sababu ni mtu anajua. Madam, nilikuwa nataka akamwambia hiyo imefungwa mpaka wakati elections itaisha ndio tutarudi pale. It is unfair because it is the only space you have to make sure that your issues are heard. But there is nowhere else. If that office desk is not there, then it means you have nowhere else. Because ukingi apale ndani unambio. Sasa unataka ni kusaidia na nini? You know? So the perception, I mean, the, the idea around gender desk is to make sure that there is there's space for women to speak their issues. Uh, in accordance with the African Commission on Human and People Rights Guidelines on Combating Va Sexual Violence and its Consequences in Africa, the Kenyan government should repeal rules and abolish practices providing for mandatory medical examination in cases of sexual violence committed during conflict. Hmm? 
you have many, 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 many um, proofs to make sure that you prove that you were raped. How do you prove you are raped when there is no hospital to go to, to be examined, if, if there is need to be examined? At the time of this violence in 2017, you remember that the public health officials were on strike. So doors were closed. Women could only access um, medic medicine from the, from the pharmacists that were on business anyway. Hmm? The Kenyan government should, without further delay, ensure that investigations are carried out into the 2017 sexual cases in order to bring the alleged perpetrators to justice and guarantee. So the Kenya Human Rights Commission has already given um, its uh, findings. Kenya National Commission gave its finding. Human Rights Watch gave its findings that confirm almost a similar pattern. Kwani jamani, nini ningine natakikana? Ikiwa, you cannot listen. Why can't you also do your own investigation to ascertain these claims? If you cannot do investigations, neither can you hear what these other people are telling you. Then you have no goodwill to resolve these problems. We are also recommending um, for the Kenyan government should conduct an independent inquiry into the issues of elections related to SGBV, Revisit the previous um, uh, reports. CPEV uh, findings were very clear that there was this issue around SGBV in 2007. That is the coalition on uh, the commission, in, the commission on inquiry on post-election violence. They were very clear. This, these issues took place, and then um, in 2017, it is clear these issues have taken place. Yeah. So we must be able to open up now and look at the history to be able to determine and also take uh, responsibility from a government's point of view. The Kenyan government should strengthen the capacity of the police to investigate and follow up cases of SGBV. I've seen that happen in various, and I've gone to Migori, there was a very good uh, police officer who was very loud around SGBV issues. If that kind of a person got support from the government itself, then he would really have the muscle to continue doing what he's, tr he's trying to do around sexual and gender-based violence in the county. So there are many decisions, including Koval. You remember the case? The, 2000 and, the 2007 case that at least favored four women? You remember that? Kulikuwa na kesi kotini. Muna kumbuka? Yeah, ambayo ilikuwa, ilitoka na kulikuwa na at least um, it favored the four women. So if decision can be implemented for this other subsequent uh, violence, then it will be good for, um, for the fight against SGBV in elections. Uh, it's guidance. It also needs to, to do uh, to, 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 to implement the guidance from, and recommendations from the 2013 TJRC report, the National Government Aff uh, Affirmative Action, and CSOs working with survivors of sexual violence should design programs and initiate initiatives for immediate livelihood reconstruction. So we must be able to look at into anapo pata, ama anapo pigwa, ama anapo repiwa. Nini ingine hawa watu wanapoteza. Kama for example 2017, kando tu na kurepiwa. Kuna wale vya kula vyao kwa hoteli zilikuliwa. Kwa hivyo unanirep, ukimaliza unakula chakula yangu mbao nilikuwa ninauza. Ndiyo sasa utoke. Hmm? Kuna wale, wana, I, I'm, I'm pesa. You rape me after you are done. You also take the small shillings that I had, also, I had made. Unaenda nazo. Hmm? Really, is that fair? So we must look at those key economic uh, impacts of SGBV uh, in elections. The Kenyan government should design a comprehensive rehabilitation program for the of election related violence. In most cases, you are left to die alone. You are left to wake up or to, st or to keep crying for the rest of your life. We must be able to identify these people and give them psychosocial support and also medical support. That way, if there is nothing else you can give them, then you would have supported um, uh, survivors of um, 
electoral sexual violence. The Kenyan government should implement their obligations in terms of guarantees of non-repetition and satisfaction, including through public apology and acknowledgement. I remember in, in Kisumu, Betty, and you remember this, in our women uh, um, meeting, uh, Governor Anyang Nyongo was part of the meeting. And we were asked, if nothing else, our Raila has moved on. If nothing else, if nothing else, you have moved on, yes. But you've left us with wounds. We may not necessarily get you money, but there's nothing that is as strong as saying Polini. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, Soila's presentation is uh, one of a kind. It's unique because I see um, emotions are high. It's touching. Nonetheless, it ends very well because we have recommendations. Recommendations to different agencies, uh, organizations, and even institutions, and even the public. Because all of us in this room have a role to play in ensuring that we do not have reoccurrence of sexual gender-based violence during election, including even media that is represented here. So very fast, we are moving uh, to the next item on our agenda which is the panel discussion. So on the panel, we have, uh, and maybe as I introduce, you can just wave so that they can get to know who you are. We have Commissioner Juliana Cherera, the Vice Chairperson Independent Electoral and, and Boundaries uh, Commission. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Beatty Mulamba. Ms. Beatty is the Program Officer, National Gender and Equality Commission. Thank you, Betty. Then we also have Dr. Mary Kimari. Dr. Mary is the Assistant Director Advisory Unit, uh, Commission on Administrative Justice. Asante. We have Mr. Evans Okeo. Mr. Evans is the Head of Investigations at the Independent Policing and Oversight Authority. That's IPOA. I see him nodding. Uh, then we have Ms. Jackie Mutere. Ms. Jackie is a women rights activist and also the co-founder of Grace Agenda. Haribuni sana. And uh, let's delve into this uh, discussion. So I'll start uh, with you, um, Commissioner. So one of the mandates of the um, IEBC is to facilitate uh, the observation, monitoring, and also evaluation of elections. Um, well noting that uh, the gender dimensions um, and also the different uh, violence patterns against women during uh, elections what, in your view, or perhaps you could also share with us uh, some of the parameters that have been put in place by the IBC um, in ensuring that uh, violence against women in the coming election is forestalled? Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I must say this is a timely discussion. And uh, for that matter, it is time that women we speak to each other. It is time that we look back and analyze, and I'm glad for the presentation today of the paper uh, report of what happened in 2017. Uh, a progressive country is one that looks back so that we can correct our mistakes. And with it, I say congratulations to the Kenya Human Rights Commission for availing this opportunity. Um, as IBC, we are mandated to conduct elections and referendum. And uh, as you all know, that this is an emotive uh, season, and we are in that year, 2022. Uh, our mandate in conducting election is to ensure that elections are free, fair, and credible. And I may ask, how do we ensure that we have free, fair, and credible elections? It is unless the elections are secure. They are free from violence, intimidation, and discrimination and apparently all that is heavy on women women are the ones that uh, bear this uh, negative negativity uh, against them in being intimidated and discriminated uh, as abc 
uh, since 2017, we did what we call the post-election evaluation. And we looked back at the things that happened. And uh, we have already formulated a policy framework, which uh, we call it the gender and social inclusion uh, framework. With that, we are looking at uh, increasing women participation in politics. Uh, our, our, our constitution has given us uh, the two-third gender role. And even for me to be a vice chair of the IEBC, it's because of the uh, provision that women we are given, that if the chair is a man, the, the vice will be the opposite gender. And for us to have women in these positions is to ensure that uh, we speak uh, for fellow women, we speak, we bring the voice of a woman uh, in these spaces so that we can protect ourselves and be able to curb the things that have been happening. So uh, as IBC, we have what we call election security um, uh, arrangement program that this is a multi-sectoral uh, organization or a group that IEBC constitutes together where we have the judiciary with us, we have the National Police Service, we have the ODPP, we have the NCIC and the Human Rights. So we've been meeting since last year uh, to plan for security during election. Uh, for us, uh, IEBC our security is within the 400 perimeter at the polling station. But you know security is holistic. That's why we partner with other agencies that have this mandate. Security is not mandate of IBC. So we partner with uh, National Police Service because they offer the holistic security for the whole country. And um, with that, we've been able to meet together and we have that uh, security arrangement program whereby we even sensitize our colleagues in, uh, in government and in agency about election operations and uh, election uh, offenses so that uh, we all know that if a political party does ABCD, uh, they are supposed to be brought this way. And uh, the political parties are governed by their constitutions. And last, uh, last year you saw us calling for political parties to bring their nomination rules. And in those nomination rules, they usually have their code of conduct. So when we announce that oh, this is official period for campaign and the like, uh, we usually go by their constitution, and if anyone breaches that constitution, they are brought to book, and they can be penalized and also be barred from vying. So that is one of the things that we are doing. The good thing now, it is we are giving it a different approach. Uh, it is an improved version of what happened in 2017 because the stakeholders have sat together and uh, improved the version in that uh, we are looking at, uh, we have included a special interest group, the youth, the women, and the people living disabilities. So our eye is gonna be keen to this special interest group. We have also done an approach that is more of preventive, rather than waiting and doing investigation and convicting the victims, because the vice will already have been done. So we are looking at preventive measures. So we have constituted uh, with the women, uh, different women groups, and we have done what we call the Women Coordinating uh, Committee for the country, which has structures into the 47 counties and 290 constituencies and down to the wards and to the villages. So this Women Coordinating Committee, it is a voice amongst women so that women we can speak amongst each other. And then it is a voice that we, we use it to for outreach, to encourage each other, to do, uh, to empower them in voter education, so that uh, women can talk to each other. We don't have to be raped for someone to get elected. That is true. We don't have to go through stuff for someone to get positions. So we are looking at women having a voice that they can say no, what you have said is wrong, and we as the women of Kenya, we are saying no to this. And I'm looking forward to that opportunity that women in Kenya will have this voice and just stand up and we'll give you platform, even in the TV. And you say, no, 
this is not the way to go. We will not allow ourselves to be raped. We will not allow ourselves to be killed. We will not allow our children to be killed. So uh, that is the Women Coordinating Committee. Uh, we also give accreditation to anyone, and we encourage most of the women to be accredited to go out and do the voter education. In the voter education, you will talk to the communities and you tell them the parameters of voting, it is all enshrined in the law. There is nothing out there. So we want people to be informed early enough before uh, you are corrupted with different ideas. Election is just your right to go exercise, to choose the leader that you want. And no one should not be intimidated to choose whoever they choose, they want to choose. And that is what we am saying. We should be able to rise up and say no. It is freedom of choice. Thank you. Um, to Jackie um, Muteri. Jackie, you are a survivor of the 2007-2008 uh, post-election violence. And as a result, you have been at the forefront in advocating for um, issues uh, or attention to issues of uh, violence against women. Please share with us what your journey has been like in terms of accessing justice. What are some of the experiences that you, you've had, uh, some of the lessons and even recommendations, uh, possible recommendations to different government uh, institutions? Thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. My name is Jack, as you have heard. Grace Agenda was formed as a response to the post-election violence of 2007-2008. And um, it's amazing that even I was even um, uh, brought uh, to be part of this conversation because it is something that is far, far, far removed from anybody's agenda. Transitional justice is a very, um, it's a, it's a very elusive thing. It's something that has faded very easily because people want to start healing. Um, even KHRC, a good selves, have uh, developed this uh, uh, document for, and it only starts from 2017. There seems to be a memory lapse or a memory gap in between 2017 and 2007, those are 10 years. So as a result of, the, of my violation, I gave birth to a baby girl. That baby girl today is going to be a teen this year. And while I appreciate Soila's story so, so much, I want to also add my voice to it in terms of a story. Um, I, I'm the one who writes my own story and I want to, uh, allow me to share what it is. Because without the story, you will not know the walk. You will not appreciate the walk. So after I had this, um, when I, after I was violated, I went to the, uh, there was a health center near where I lived. The health center had closed because there was, um, it, there was a curfew. The curfew at that time was from 12 o'clock during the day. No, it was from 6 o'clock. But because nurses have to commute to go to their houses, they are unable to stay um, beyond 12 o'clock So because they have to go to their places. So the health center was closed. So I decided to walk to the police station. The police station t told me exactly what Soila has said, that there are more important things, that there are more important things, that, um, issues that are happening in the country right now. So it's difficult for, for, for us to even give you an OB. Um, I went and of course, the follow that was in January, January 16th, 2000 uh, 2008. February 2008, I discovered I was pregnant. I'm going to cut this long story short. Um, I tried three times, twice to, have a, to, twice to have an abortion. The first time I was unable to do it because I, the money that I needed um, that particular year uh, was when uh, the Kenya National Examination Council decided to uh, manage fraud and uh, all children, there was a new rules for all the, the students and uh, candidates had to have photographs. They had, there was fees to be paid, there was a new thing. So the money that I had, I had to give it to my daughter. She was a, a candidate at that time. Then the second time I tried, I went and I wanted to go to some quack institution near where I lived, but there was a crackdown during that time. So I was unable to, do, to, to have it done there. So the third time I actually sat in a clinic, but by that time I was far advanced. And since I was unable to have it, I, I sat and actually waited for the doctor. I waited there from about 11 o'clock until 5 o'clock in the evening, but he had gone for, for some uh, mission and he was in, um, uh, working outside. So later on he came and told me, I'm unable to do it, so let's, me so let's meet uh, a little bit later. But by that time I was too far gone, so my next option was actually to give up the child for adoption, because I was not going to give birth to any child that belongs to a certain tribe, which I will not name. Uh, uh, for me it was a Jambazi, I tried because they had violated me and I did not want to have anything like that. 
So there's something that um, people are not aware of, they might not be aware of, something called a mother offer, that you can actually give your child out. Not for adoption, you give your child. And I wanted to give away that child. But, it, but uh, there's a way, there's a, there's a disclaimer, there's a clause, there's a catch. You can only give the child out after six weeks. And of course, after six weeks, after you've roomed in and you've bonded with the child, even after hours, you can't give away the child. Cut a long story short, I went to hospital. I had the baby by cesarean section. And when I was, I, I, I had sorted it out with my brothers. I had, we, um, I had uh, planned with my brothers how we're going to get rid of this child. And so for some reason, when I had, uh, I called the, the um, He's called the caseworker at, at the Child Welfare Society. He was unable, I was unable to access him. I was unable to find him. So um, uh, nothing happened. So even I had actually planned even with the nurses at Kenyatta. Sorry, I, this, is, this is Kenya. I, can't, I just have to tell you that anything is possible. Anything can be done. So when I planned them, it backfired. So when I came out of theater, I had a children crying. Of course, because it, it's a recovery ward and it's a maternity ward, children must be crying. But I didn't realize that this cry was coming from right next to me. So when I turned and I opened, I, I saw a bundle right next to me. They had put the baby next to me. And I, I found a baby, and that baby was so beautiful. So, so beautiful. So, so beautiful. Her name is Jasmine. She's just a flower. Thank you. Feel free to clap for me. <laughs> uh, so now Jasmine is 14 years old. And 14 years old is the journey that which we have walked in trying to seek and access justice. Um, so I've got some notes that, that I had um, uh, sh uh, written out here, so uh, I'll just allow me to go quickly go through them. Um, I also want to appreciate FIDH because uh, you were able to support me to go the, to the Assembly of State Parties, where I was able actually to share my voice and to challenge what government was saying, that they were supporting victims of the post-election violence and survivors of the post-election violence to be supported um, through the process. Um, so what happened is... Um, Thereafter, I participated in the TJRC process. I was a statement taker, and then I also met very many women who had been violated. I was actually post I was posted in Nairobi. So in the different areas of Nairobi, I was able to highlight um, and get very many stories from the women who had been violated, women who had also were IDPs from other parts of the country, but they had been transported by a lorry, ended up somewhere in Limuru, dumped, and then there was, a, there was an IDP camp in Limuru somewhere. And I met very many women from that particular area, if you, if you go back to, um, to, the, um, to the records. So what happened in Kenya, they started the Special Programs Ministry. So the Special Programs, their focus was on IDPs. Their focus was on uh, com com uh, compensating and resettling IDPs, giving people who had lost their cows, giving people who had uh, lo lost their grains, who they lost their goats and, the ca and their cows. That's what, um, uh, that, that's what a special program had focused in. There was nothing to do with sexual violence, nothing to do with the actual violations. Then, of course, the part of the TGRC was to release a report to show comprehensively what had happened during that time. But they went beyond that, and it started actually from the, the post-independence time, and they brought it all the way up till um, 2007, uh, 2008. So um, we started speaking and um, sharing about our experiences. And we thought um, that uh, we were invited to meetings, just like I've been invited here. But um, thereafter, it was now exactly what uh, Soila has done. It is Soila speaking for somebody else. That, Soila, well, I appreciate the story. Thank you very much. But it is not the victim or the survivor speaking. There is something that happens. It becomes an agenda for somebody else. And that's actually what happened. It, it, it um, translated. The story changed. That survivors are not speaking for themselves. This is a Western agenda. Civil society organizations are getting money to overthrow Kenya's government. So that was also downplayed. And it was, also, it was mis misconstrued and misrepresented. So what one of the things that I thought about was actually thinking about how we could have uh, an amplified voice. And that is how Greece's agenda was born. Um, well... I've noted here that we did not have goats and cows and maize and a harvest, um, but our point is, our, our message was, who was going to recognize our pain? Who was going to acknowledge? And who was going to count our scars? Because our scars are invisible. They're not visible. They're like a cut and a bruise. And ultimately, who speaks for us? So that's when we decided they were going to speak for ourselves, and that was the birth of Grace Agenda. But then the problem was, what is it that I wanted to say? And how did I want to say it? I did, not know, I, I did not know how to articulate the way I do know how right now. And um, the idea of uh, stigma is a, is, a, is a very critical thing. And um, being visibly recognized as, some, as, as, um, as a victim. And please allow me to share that 
stop victimizing people by using the word victim. Use the word survivor. The victims are the ones that are in the mortuary. Survivors are the ones who are like here, like me now, who, who survived to tell the tale. You survived to, say, to, 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 say, to tell your story. That's a survivor. So then um, we discovered the concept of reparations. Reparations is speaking is, is, is not necessarily compensation, but the ability to be, to, be, to be repaired. And that's the word that we use amongst survivors, to be repaired for the pain and for the losses that you incurred. Because nobody can. The visible line said, you, you're, you're, you're being, you, actually you are being compensated, but somehow you're just simply being repaired because a dress that is torn, even if you stitch it, it does not go back to its original form. And it can never go back to its original form. But something had been taken from us and we wanted to take it back. And that we wanted to speak for ourselves. So one of the things that happened is that we built our capacity and our capacity was being built for self-agency. So that we would have the ability to tell our, our, our own story so that it does not become somebody else's story but that it becomes our story. So um, uh, together with like-minded partners, we have been supported. We have uh, um, participated in um, community dialogue. We have exp expanded the network. We have strengthened relationships. We have had exposure trips. And we've also supported welfare groups to start based on the, organiza uh, based on the, the numbers of uh, survivors that are in a particular area. So now, over the years, what has happened is, first of all, we participated in the police vetting process. We participated in the police vetting process. <laughs> That's just on a light note. <laughs> um, but um, we, our participation was really just filling, it was just the initial stages of um, institutional reforms that we had asked for uh, um, from the TGRC and, and from the dialogue process, the outcomes of the dialogue process. And in our participation, we wanted specifically survivors of sexual violence to share their stories. So the complaints form the way it is, it, it is, um, it, it is um, it, the way it is is that you, have a, you, you can fill your first page, you, your details, and then continue filling the form. But survivors did not want to, to fill in their details, their personal details, because of the fear of retaliation from the cops and from informers within our own communities who work with cops that are able to inform on you that this one went and filled uh, a, poli a, police, um, uh, a police complaint about, uh, against you. So we participated in that process, and many of the names that came out uh, were the proxy names. Police use proxy names. They do not use your name like um, Julius or Justice or Jackie. They will call Murefu, Mule Kubwa, um, Mousi, Black Beauty. They use proxy names. So if you, if you do not know, so, so the, um, the process of the, the, the police vetting process, are filling in the, the, the complaints forms, just added value by showing the police that there were violations that took place and that there were these officers, these duty bearers who participated in this process. And that they are just not very good people also and that they are human and that they are very well able. Because now you're going to ask, who, who, do you know his name? No. Do you know his number? The way cops come into a community, first of all, they come in their jackets. You cannot read a service number. And when he's raping or violating you, how are you going, what time are you going? You're so, you're so dumbfounded. You're, so, you're, you're in pain. You're... you're you're not thinking about reading a service number that is, first of, first of all, it's like a, an airtime card that has got almost 11 digits. Are you going to start putting that in your head or are you going to think about, first of all, your recovery process and how to get out of that, that situation? We've participated in petitions. We've uh, taken petitions to Parliament. We've taken petitions to the Senate. And we've also taken petitions to the African Commissions. Um, recently, we, we, one of the things that we also wanted, uh, we, we thought was going to be a uh, hope was the 10 billion justice restoration fund. I think um, uh, Soila alluded to it in, in part of the reparations agenda. When His Excellency, Excellency in the 2015 State of the Nation addressed, spoke about the 10 billion justice fund that was supposed to take care of historical injustices, we thought that that was going to be, um, uh, that, that was a hope, uh, especially for uh, reparations. But then it was supposed to take place over a period of about three years, but that didn't happen. Um, in the, the process again, uh, there was also, we participated in the UPR process, which is the Universal Peer Review uh, of, uh, for Human Rights. And uh, we participated in that. Uh, but our, the, delegate, the delegation from Kenya that went there to speak said that they actually had compensated 
all of the victims. They had compensated all the pe uh, people. The special programs had taken pay, taken care of most of the, uh, the the IDPs had been resettled. Medical care had been given, and it was a whole big fancy report about the work that government had done. We participated in the the BBI, but uh, WAPI. We participated in UPR, WAPI. We presented a petition to the women rep, WAPI. Uh, we have uh, we have actually seen impunity take take root simply because there has been no response because all all, all that the, all we do is we we give them fuel for their fire we um, just like right now uh, madam uh, madam has said that uh, now there's a a good uh, a committee of women that goes out to talk and i'm sure you're going to go and talk and talk about violence and you're going to talk about sexual violence but it will just be talk from a podium it will not be anything tangible that you have. The reason I say that, my daughter is 14 years. I am sitting here. There is evidence that something took place to me. So we even participated in a public interest litigation. But the public interest litigation, you have to have documents that will hold that, make it tangible. You have to have a police, um, a, a police uh, OB. You need to have medical documents. And then you, those are the things, those are the two key things that will enable you to go um, um, to... to for, for, for the litigation. But given on what the study has shared, how many women will first of all think about a police report? How many women will think even about, even about uh, um, going to hospital? In Mount Elgon, we, want, we went uh, with KTN. Mount Elgon, my dear, we're talking about first of all climbing a mountain for two hours. When your body is ravaged, is broken, are you going to think about going for two hours? Are you going to think about, first of all, defending your children from the would-be marauders that are about to come? You're thinking about protection of your family. You're thinking about protection for your children. You're not thinking about even going to hospital. Women don't think about themselves first. They think of their family. And many, many of the, of the women who ended up having children from the violations are simply because their bodies were second. They did not think about themselves uh, first. They thought, they thought about the children and their families first. Ah, okay. Can you please so summarize? Now, uh, yeah, summarize. I'm telling you, 14 years is very difficult to put into eight minutes. But, uh, but I'm also trying to rush through it. Thank you. So one of the things, uh, the concept of reparations. Uh, reparations is different things to different people. Justice is also different things to different people. And there's the international definition of reparations. There's the government's take on definition, and there's um, the survivor's co um, perception of reparations. A survivor's concept of reparations is a survivor-centered approach. You think that by giving me money, you have healed me. You haven't. When we did a small research and we did a small study, one of the th th key things some women wanted, they do not trust government, let them be given money, they go sort themselves out. Others said, me, I want a medical card I will be to, to take care of all the pro problems in my body. That, for me, is what will, will have taken care of me. So thinking that you're going to give a blanket, a blanket, um, um, a blan a blanket program that is going to cover, and then you pat yourself on the back and say that I have repaired women, we have done women interventions, and, and, and survivors are, have been taken care of, is a fallacy, and you need to reconsider that. So one of the things that we did at the ACP and the UPR process was that I challenged what government had said that it had done and what we saw. I said that it had done nothing. So I disputed this openly because I have yet to meet a survivor in this country who has been repaired and or compensated for the human rights violation they have experienced. Numbers speak. They say something. And this study speaks and says something. That is why the, the Waki Commission said it, the TGRC report said it, the Human Rights Watch report said it, Kenya National Commission for Human Rights said it, and now the KHRC report is saying it. But these man, numbers have come, they have, they, the, the numbers come and go. So what is it speaking about? It's simply saying that there is impunity. One of, the, one of the key things that should be dealt with is the culture of impunity, because people think they can do this from to, to, um, 1992 to, to 2002. 2007, 2013, 2017, nobody has been uh, uh, taken into custody for sexual violence. And so anybody can feel like they can do anything, as we also so recently had. So um, today we are presented, I'm finishing, I'm finishing. So today we are presented with facts that beg to be acknowledged. Um, this re this uh, uh, report serves as a warning, as a clear signal. It serves as an alert that there, there needs to be some state actions. And one of the recommendations, as I finish, is that we need to increase the voices. 
It should just not be that we keep releasing studies, uh, calling Daisy, calling Betty, calling Jackie, calling IBC, to give us big talk and to give us shop talk. It should be some tangible, um, uh, some tangible um, resolutions. It should be about the reparations agenda. If the reparations agenda, if we really want to do something, if we want to make this study also count for something, that we should actually have a specific implementation agenda towards the same. And above all, you need to build the capacity of survivors, number one for self-agency and number one for advocacy. If you put another 10 jackies like this in front of the AG, in front of the office of the president, we can say something. Our numbers with our ability to articulate will be able to say something. And now finally, finally. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is powerful. Okay. Um, let me just, let me give you my prayer. My prayer is that this report will help to break the silence on sexual violence. It will generate the action needed, and beyond this, that the need for action of the 10 billion fund promised by His Excellency and the TJRC report, more urgently, reparations for sexual violence will be, will be, will be implemented. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. That is call to action. Uh, over to the only gentleman on the panel, Mr. Evans Okeo. Uh, from Soila's presentation, it is evident that... Uh, survivors have lost trust in the police. And this is maybe because of the frustrations that they go through in uh, accessing justice. Um, also, importantly, that, uh, between March, 2000, uh, March 2020, 2021 and August 2021, over 240 cases of uh, torture, ill treatment, and even extrajudicial killings were reported even recorded by the civil society organizations. And um, this are happening, or this was done or committed by men in uniform in the name of uh, maintaining law and order. We are going to have an election in just um, under seven months and uh, amidst a pandemic as well, because we are living in unprecedented um, times. So the question is, uh, what is um, IPOA doing uh, to in, uh, monitor the conduct of police uh, in the coming general election? Wow, thank you very much. Um, to start with, just to give a perspective of what IPOA does, um, under Section 6 of our Act, IPOA has three main functions. Number one is to investigate complaints against the police. Uh, number two is to monitor policing operations affecting mem members of the public. Um, so election is one of those policing operations that we will be monitoring. And, and finally, we also do conduct inspections of police premises, including detention facilities. Um, in summary form, going into um, the 2022 elections as an authority, um, plans we have put plans in place uh, to sort of uh, prepare and to deal with uh, complaints as and when they come. Um, we did monitor um, uh, policing operation around uh, the 2017 general elections and in fact publish a report which we shared with our stakeholders. Um, we, in that report, we did make recommendations to the National Police Service. Among the recommendations that we made well, number one, uh, on public order management um, in terms of equipment, for instance, imploring the police that when they deploy officers to deal with uh, such situations, uh, less lethal weapons um, are used. And in this case, if you deploy police officers and the only weapon they have is a rifle, for instance, of course, uh, the end result would be death or serious injury. But if um, instead they are armed with less lethal weapons like buttons or rubber bullets, then, of course, they're able to adequately also respond. Um, we also did make recommendations on trading, specifically in the area of public order management, um, as well as a recommendation on intelligence-led policing, such that then if we are mapping out um, uh, conflict-prone areas, then the police need to... Uh, deploy intelligence-led policing as, as opposed to all the other time, you know, reactionary uh, uh, mode of response where they deploy lethal force. 
So one of the things we have done, we and we are currently doing right now, is to uh, is to get feedback from the police. We, in fact, we have written to the IG um, asking for feedback on the recommendations we made with regard to the 2017 election. Uh, number two, we are also engaging um, with key stakeholders, the IBC, KNCHR, the ODPP. We are a member of ESAP, the Election Security Arrangement Program, where we have also participated in coming up with a handbook um, uh, on, 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 the, on security during the election period. And in fact, uh, of importance is um, what we call the Commander's Manual. What the Commander's Manual intends to do is to put a responsibility on the commanders because we realized in the, um, in the other cases we have been investigating, um, what comes out is we do not get to the specific perpetrator. But if we're able to put a responsibility on the commanders, then we should be able to also put an obligation of them with regard to documenting and also reporting as required under the IPOA Act. Um, uh, we are also engaging, uh, uh, we also engage in, in, in uh, sensitization uh, through the media uh, and actively also through, through, the, through the social media platform. Um, and of course, in the area of training, we are also uh, building capacity of um, our monitors, our legal officers, as well as our investigators. And I want to allude to the findings uh, by, by KHRC on, 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 on with regard to, uh, to the violence that was meted on the women during the 2017 election. Um, their finding is accurate. We did also conduct investigation into such incidents, and, and the findings we made uh, was that most of the perpetrators were men in uniform. And, and, uh, and because there's a gap in our laws where we are putting a lot of burden on the victims or the survivors to prove their case, and, and that argument also came out prominently during the Koval case, where in fact the court said that uh, we do not need to put that burden on the victims. And, and in fact, they're saying the absence of, of a medical report should not be an excuse for not investigating such incidents. What we are doing currently is we are now looking at international law, um, specifically the Rome Statute, which we domesticated, as well as the International Crimes Act, which we actually passed. And it also forms part of our law. And what we have done recently is we have trained our officers in the area of international law such that when such incidents happen, you realize they are not isolated cases as it were. We have community of victims. There's a pattern that is very clear where you can actually see that they are moving from door to door. They were dressed in this manner and they were raping. They were subjecting their victims to gang rape. And therefore, that is the direction we are taking and we are partnering with the DPP uh, to try and bring um, these perpetrators to book. Finally, we cannot do this alone. We still need oper operationalization of other critical pieces of legislation, like the Coroner's Act. It is important that we all continuously lobby and ask the government to operationalize this law. Because like what we witnessed the other day, um, the bodies that were retrieved from Riviala. If we had a coroner in place, I mean, we would be able to um, work closely with the coroner and perhaps um, uh, bring the perpetrators to book. As well as the Prevention of Torture Act, we need to have that operational as well, such that we can all collaborate and, and, and uh, be accountable to uh, to members of the public uh, on whose behalf we tirelessly work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, to Dr. Uh, Kamari, uh, and in, uh, regarding uh, as regards political uh, violence, uh, we have seen, uh, the ten uh, pol uh, we have seen um, tendencies of impunity. This is because perpetrators have not been brought to book and they've been able to get away with this uh, crimes. At the same time, uh, from the survivors, we see unfair administration of justice. And so we just wanted to get from you what is the um, place 
of uh, CAJ uh, to just ensure effective administration of um, uh, judicial ad administration um, in ensuring that injustices uh, of sexual gender-based violence do, are, are really acted upon. Thank you very much. Uh, my name once again is Dr. Mary Kimari from the Commission Administrative Justice. I note that uh, the question that has been placed uh, on me uh, picks me from uh, my position as a member of the National Council uh, of Administrative Justice and not the Commission Administrative Justice. But fortunately, since we are a member of that specific council, I'm able to address that specific question. Now, uh, one of the things that we've been doing as a, the office of the Ombudsman is uh, uh, realigning or uh, managing the various complaints that have been coming to us, in essence, trying to ensure that there's administrative justice. So there's no delay, there's no unresponsiveness based on the complaints that we are getting on the areas of either the judiciary not managing the cases in the shortest time possible. We've realized uh, as now the commission within the membership of NCAJ that the one thing uh, that has been agreed upon is uh, uh, the creation or the setting apart of some courts so that they can manage these specific matters in the shortest time possible. I note as we're going on with the discussion on the gender-based violence, just last year, the commission uh, was a main contributor in the line ministry uh, of devolution and gender, as we're even going through uh, documents to come up with a more robust way of dealing with issues that affect uh, gender, and especially now on, uh, on gender-based violence, to try and see how best that they can mitigate that by the year, this specific year of 2022. I also note that uh, the Commission Administrative Justice has also been a main contributor in the police as uh, they were coming up with one of their strategic uh, program on polycare, which is supposed to be handling the gender-based violence uh, in one stop, a one shop stop scenario, whereby you don't have to go to various other offices when you have, uh, when you have um, a complaint or when you have a claim on this specific area. The Commission Administrative Justice has two main mandates. The first one is uh, redressing of maladministration. So we come in really heavily to try and ensure that these other players who are dealing with the gender-based violence do not take inordinate or do not inordinately delay in the way in which they deal with the complaints or the claims or uh, the, 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 when you come and file in the complaint, that is what I need to communicate. The second one is on the access to information. We have our second mandate uh, on the area of access to information. This squarely lies under Article 35 of our Constitution. And I think this is something that we need to look at as we're even talking about the election violence. Because without that information, a major problem arises. That's the reason we've been having so much problems. If you got the information real time, then you manage to know how to deal with that specific problem or that specific complaint. One of the things that the Commission Administrative Justice has done uh, is that we have set up a uh, a state-of-the-art complaints management information system because we realize we've moved away from the, manual, uh, from the manual era to the digital area where we need to undertake to carry out an online tracking system of all the complaints that we are getting so that we may have a rapid response to that which we are being told from all corners of our country. We've gone further to ensure that we strengthen the partnerships that we've had Remember the end of the day, if you have a friend today and you want to maintain the friend, you must work at it. So we've really tried in the last year to strengthen our partnership with the various relevant stakeholders, i.e. we've had NCIC on board. Uh, we've really contributed to their peace charter so that in essence, they may also help us to perform on the aspect of ensuring that there's administrative justice. We've also uh, strengthened again our partnership with uh, FEMWISE, FEMWISE is an organization that is in Rwanda 
that has actually helped us to understand the early warning systems. So we have this specific program currently, which we are going now to be rolling out in our country. But fortunately or unfortunately, we are targeting the women leaders. We feel that the women leaders will have a better voice for us to manage to percolate it to the grassroots where we have the women. Remember, they speak the same language, they understand one another, they know each other's problems. So this is a program that we are actually going to be uh, bringing on board uh, by the end of, I think, this, either this uh, month or next, early next month. So this is one of the ways or some of the ways in which the Commission Administrative Justice is trying to manage political violence having uh, seen the, 20, the 2007 and also the 2013 uh, issues that arose, and also managing to have mitigating structures in place. Okay, thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm Malamba Betty. I work with the National Gender and Equality Commission, which is a constitutional uh, commission established under the National Gender Act of 20, 2011 in the Constitution under the pursuant to Article 59. That is clauses four and five. Now, our mandate as the Commission uh, is to promote and ensure gender, in, gender equality and non discrimination as according to the Constitution of Kenya. Now, and our area of focus, we focus on uh, special interest groups. This includes women, children, youth, the older persons of the society, the marginalized and the minority, and also the persons with disabilities. Now, when you look at our act, uh, we have a total of 16 functions, which are summarized into eight. The commission has a mandate to do, to carry out, to do monitoring. Other than monitoring, we do facilitate, we have a facilitative role, a coordinative role. We also do uh, research, and carry out audits and investigate cases and also check on compliance and facilitate. Now to answer uh, Nerima's question on uh, our participation, as in how the Commission promotes participation of women in public affairs. Now, uh, we note that public affairs can either be at a workplace or even uh, in elections, in politics. Now, for f the first uh, function I can say, the Commission actually monitors the indicators of gender equality and inclusion uh, for performance contracting for MDS, that is the ministries, department, and agency. As a commission, we receive these reports on a, on, a, on a quarterly basis, and we check whether they have included all the special interest groups. All agencies need to comply. Now, other than that, the commission has also been at the forefront to ensure that the two-thirds gender rule is upheld. We currently, we, we actually launched a report in 29, 2019. The report is titled The Journey Towards Realization of Two Thirds Gender Rule, Gender Framework. And it actually documents the commission roles in promoting and enhancing the not, not more than two thirds gender rule. Other than that, we find that the Commission also facilitates the development of gender mainstreaming policy and also the SGB, that is the sexual and gender, gender, gender based violence policies for agencies in, recognition, in recognizing the fact that GBV and sexual harassment are some of the barriers for women participation, whether in politics or at our workplace. Other than that, uh, the Commission has also come up with a prototype uh, legal framework. We currently, for the counties, and currently we have Meru County that has actually used the the documents to, Meru, to come up with their SGBV policy for the county. Now the Commission has also, uh, also undertakes sensitization of women leadership. Women need to participate in, 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 in politics. And some of, some of the women do not know their rights. So it is important that they are actually sensitized on their rights and uh, to enable them to participate. 
Now, other than that, we also find that uh, the commission currently support financial support from and technical technical support from an organization equality now is revamping the sexual gender-based information system whereby we'll be using this system to to collect to collect data of these cases across across board currently the system is being reviewed is yet to be finalized but we hope that by the time we have elections the system will, will be up so that stakeholders can use that system to input uh, data for these cases uh, the commission also reviews bills policies and regulations to ensure the principles of gender equality and inclusion are upheld in all areas I'll give an example. Currently on my desk, I have a political parties amendment bill. So I'm going to review it and, ju and just to check that all these uh, concepts, the gender equality, the principles are being upheld. Now, other than that, the commission through its equality and inclusion technical working groups, uh, groups in collaboration with the State Department of Gender, is actually currently disseminating the national policy on gender development of 2019 across the country. The policy, we, we find that it actually calls for concerted efforts to be made and adequate resources allocated to the processes, processes of institutionalizing gender equality for a fairer and transformed society in which women, men, boys and girls will benefit and finally we find that uh, in counties that practice negotiated democracies the commission through public education forums works in close collaboration with the council of elders we note that kenya is a patriarchal society first of all we find that most women rely on decision made by men women take a back seat so in such areas we we actually work very closely with the council of elders in these counties to demystify the need for women participation in all spheres and also to do away with cult cultural practices that actually hinder the participation of women in politics. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Betty. Uh, I think I want to take this opportunity to thank all uh, the panelists, uh, starting from my far end. Uh, to this end, Asante Nisana for uh, those important insights around this topic, of, um, uh, especially during this time. So indeed, this discussion uh, generally is timely, and uh, it's just also a wake-up call uh, for all of us also to pull up our socks in dif uh, the different uh, uh, areas of our work and even organizations that we represent to ensure that we are able to um, uh, ensure justice for the survivors and also at the same time fight impunity because indeed it's the major hindrance to um, access to justice for the, um, for the uh, survivors of gender-based violence. At the same time, um, I want to also thank uh, all the other participants, uh, more so those represented by the organizations that I had uh, mentioned and uh, as I do that, I want to just uh, request this panel maybe to take their seats so that we allow the others to come and just weigh in also into this discussion. Okay, thank you. So we just thought that it is important that you're here. Uh, we give you two minutes to just weigh into this discussion, considering you are critical actors uh, in this matter. So I'll just start uh, with uh, Izzy Amdani from Crown Trust. Asante Sana. And thank you for um, this, for, for really highlighting uh, the issue of SGBV. Um, I think that one of the things um, that we need to talk about, and I was hoping to hear from IBC, uh, Madam Chairperson of IBC, Betty, so that you, the Madam Chairperson can hear what I'm asking. I don't know if there will be an opportunity for them to respond. However, um, 
IBC is tasked with ensuring party primaries, uh, con the conduct of party primaries. IBC is on record and under court order to ensure the two-thirds gender principle is met. Now, we know that political violence is a strategy that has been deployed against women. And so far, IBC has not shown, has not, it does not inspire confidence uh, in their ability to be able to enforce this because IBC is on record saying that they will reject any lists that do not meet the two thirds gender principle. However, IBC was arm twisted recently to degazette the campaign financing uh, rules, which uh, is also a, a constitutional requirement. So, I do not know how you are going to do this, and we need to hear what IBC is also doing with political parties to ensure that they are able to have safe processes. The implications of the Political Parties Act amendments to zoning of um, political areas and the implications of that in terms of violence for people who will be participating as well as women's participation. So there are many questions that we have um, around uh, this issue and we know that uh, uh, violence is one of the, the means by which uh, women are deterred. Also, you talk about security deployment, but also over deployment of security agencies is also a deterrent because security agencies also have been known to violate. So I think that with um, that we would want to hear more from IBC about how they are going to counter this, including online violence against women. This has now become another strategy. We have candidates at all levels, levels uh, you know, governors, uh, aspirants, uh, you know, um, MPs, who now have bloggers who they, they, they pay to run online smear campaigns, and some of them of a sexual nature, traumatizing, fake news and all that. This is a new territory. How is IBC going to counter this? Because some of it leads to violence uh, and some of it is also violent engagement. So I think that um, uh, these are some of the questions that we would need answered in terms of being able to uh, inspire confidence uh, uh, around the, the, the electoral process right now. When we look at the police, um, I think that uh, there are some questions that also have not been answered. You know, in 2017, we have people who, even in your report from the uh, uh, survivors, was that the people who perpetrated this violence were alleged police. So they were people in uniform. And we know that in some instances we saw in the media People dressed in what seemed to be police uniform with dreadlocks. Uh, so who were these people? And maybe the police can also tell us if these days police wear dreadlocks. If they are not police, who were they? And is police being infiltrated? And if so, then what does this mean? Even in terms of security and accountability uh, um, ahead of the game. We saw police arriving in certain cities in Kisumu with body bags. I mean, like, really, that's a statement that the, the state, the, the police is making, that we have come here and we are ready to kill you. And I think we all remember this. Um, and I think that these remain unanswered questions because we have not been able, as Jackie said, to, uh, to, to have accountability. And now we are going into an election where impunity has been entrenched. And we've added another dimension because nowadays the army are also being deployed. What does that mean? You know, in terms of securing the electoral process. When it comes to the NGEC, you know, uh, I have issues with NGEC, including that one of their commissioners is openly partisan. Uh, uh, you know, campaigning on a tribal and partisan platform for an institution that is supposed to be independent. Does the Commission on Administration of Justice uh, initiate investigations against these kinds of violation? What is IBC doing against an open constitutional violation that is being carried out? Uh, you know, um, so the reason why I'm raising this is because it also shows the masculation of our independent institutions. When GEC talks about engaging with negotiated democracy, negotiated democracy is against the constitution. It violates article 38 
on people's freedom to choose their political parties or their political, uh, you know, to make political choices. And of course, we know because of patri the patriarchal nature of society, of, of uh, those, particularly those societies that engage in negotiated democracy, women don't feature. They don't feature women, youth, persons with disability do not feature. So even engaging with these structures to try and plead with them as opposed to dismantling these structures so that we are able to move on. Because remember that the Constitution says that any practice that violates uh, our rights uh, should, is, is void. So, you know, going in to ensure that, um, that these practices are outlawed and that you tell them that these practices cannot be allowed. You know, because it, it's as though we have backslidden. And so for me, I think that one of the things that we must do, not just, um, you know, as civil society actors, but also as the Angaza movement, this is, these are the things that we need to raise our voices against. Um, we need to revisit many of the Agenda 4 items from 2008, because Kenya has backslidden in a, backslidden in a big way. Um, when the chair, vice chair of IBC talks about the Women's Coordinating Committee, I hope that that's not the only structure with which you are going to engage women, because IBC has a constitutional mandate to engage all stakeholders. And I was at that meeting and actually left because I, we did not feel, uh, with my colleague with whom we left, that the meeting was representative of the women's rights organization. So now we have a structure that's not representative, that's engaging. So there are many issues. And, and I don't want us to be comfortable thinking that we are going into an election in a good way. I think that already we have very many red flags for the 2022 elections, and we really need to raise our voices Given that, including internationally, when um, Jackie talks about, you know, being able to go out and count the government's uh, uh, narrative, we have a big problem because our government sits on very many apex institutions around the world. The United Nations Security Council, Kenya sits there representing Africa. Our president is the chairman of the Peace and Security Commission of the AU. And you know that those are cent very central, especially when there's conflict in countries. Well, he's the president of the ACP, uh, you know, the African, Caribbean, and Pacific countries, as well as the chair of the EAC. So in light of their, so you can see that they have an international stage to which they speak their narrative. We must have a counter narrative as civil society groups, because we are entering into a, a, what, made what looks like maybe a difficult time for us as a country and uh, we need to get serious about what we're getting into because impunity has been so entrenched and the status of women has been brought so low by the refusal of this government to implement the bare minimum constitutional imperatives on women's representation. So showcasing that women are not really important, the way they handle GBV, you know, it, women are not important. So women becoming collateral in a high stakes violent elections is a real possibility. And that's where we must come in. That is how we must come in and we must lay a demand on independent institutions to play their constitutional role and to safeguard women's participation in the elections. That's my two minutes, thank you. <laughs> two minutes indeed. Thank you so much, Daisy. Um, those are major concerns that you raised there. And I just hope that uh, representatives from um, relevant authorities have taken note of that. And to the civil society, uh, we hear from Daisy, there's a need for a counter narrative regarding uh, some of these issues. Um, over to Agatha. We have Agatha, yes, Agatha Bang uh, from the o Office of the uh, ODPP. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Two minutes to just weigh into this discussion. Uh, first, I want to apologize for Madam Ouya who had to leave on official duties. But we thank you for the opportunity to have us here today. And um, as an office, we are glad to be part of this event today. Um, firstly, I would like to say as the office, our mandate is quite clear in the Constitution, Article 147. 
majorly regarding the prosecution. And as an office, we, we, we do act on uh, complaints and um, issues that are brought to us. And we do work with our partners and stakeholders. We act on files that have been brought to our attention. Um, and we act um, in terms of uh, prosecuting and ensuring that justice is given to the, to, to the various complaints that come, to, come our way. So we are supportive. We ask that um, the, the, any cases are documented and forwarded to our office so that we can follow up with the relevant agencies and relevant stakeholders so that we ensure that uh, our mandate is carried out. And we also push the other in institutions to carry out their mandate as well. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, um, Agatha. Uh, quickly, we'll move to Anne Katharima. Anne is from ELOG. Anne, please, the floor is yours. In two minutes, share with us what your insights are on this um, uh, important discussion. We are coming to an election in August, and uh, we have this uh, adage in this country that justice denied, I mean, justice delayed is justice denied. Atrocities have been committed in this country. Crimes against humanity on women has been committed. But here we are going to an election. No one has been brought to book. Baby Pendo, nothing has happened. And victims, and I'm using this word victims, I know Jackie said we should talk about survivors, but also talking about the victims of post-election. What has happened? Has there anyone been put into account? And I know we were having a tete-a-tete -tete with uh, colleagues from IPOA and NPS, and is, the question was, why is it that nothing is happening, justice has not happened, and they're like, it's being investigated. But the question is, for how long? So by the time we are having that election in uh, August, what has happened? So is it that we are going to continue with a cycle in this country where we say, accept and move on? And I've heard we have so many survivors in this room. So what happens to them? Who speaks on their behalf? Who is going to give them repatriation where for atrocities that were committed to them? And also the issue of hate speech. Maybe this is a place where IBC needs to look into. And when I say hate speech, I know that is the mandate of NCIC. But we see things are happening on social media. But who is, which government agency is looking into social media? Drums of war are being beaten in social media. Who is policing that part? Who is going to put into account and bring sanity in the social spaces? And we know. Cambridge Analytica happened in 2017, so we are not even sure what formula or what agency is coming up come 2022. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Anne. Thank you, that is so powerful. Uh, to Esther, Miss Esther Nganga of uh, Internal Affairs Unit, over to you, just share with us what your thoughts are. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank uh, Kenya Commission on Human Rights uh, for this opportunity. Uh, congratulations uh, for this uh, research that has been done. I also want to thank all the institutions that are represented here and also the survivors. Uh, we really thank you for the courage and for coming out to just give your stories. My name is Esther Nganga from the National Police Service, specifically from the Internal Affairs Unit. Uh, I've been a police officer for the last uh, almost 15 years. I've worked in various parts of our country, and I've also worked almost eight years in the Internal Affairs Unit. Uh, the Internal Affairs Unit of the National Police Service is uh, an internal, internal accountability unit that uh, receives and investigates complaints against police officers. Uh, for us, we do all manner of complaints, even what are considered as uh, small complaints, like a very big percentage of those complaints are cases of inaction. But we believe that if we can handle even those small complaints, then we're not even going to get to a place where we deal with now what we are calling the big complaints. But either way, uh, my colleague from IPOA also spoke, and uh, we really work uh, well together. Let me say that as an internal affairs unit, we are also cognizant of the that we are in uh, as a country, and we have uh, a number of things that we are focusing on to ensure that we are also prepared 
uh, for this period. Uh, one of the things that we have done is, and we are doing, uh, Internal Affairs Unit, we are in Nairobi. We are also in four other regions. We are in Kisumu, we are in Mombasa, we are in Nakuru and Nyeri. So what we are doing right now is also strengthening, strengthening our regional offices and also seeing uh, and uh, trying to lobby for resources to also have uh, our, our, our offices in the other regions. Because we have realized, and one, one of the things that keep coming out of this report is that our citizens do not know about Internal Affairs Unit. And Internal Affairs Unit, we even have an anonymous reporting system. And this is uh, when, when we, you cannot access a police station, this is something, this is a channel that you can use to even uh, give your complaints and we will be able to, 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 to look at which police station to address and how we can address it. So that is one of the things we are doing. We are also really focusing on uh, create, creating awareness because we have realized that uh, even police officers, even police officers and members of public do not understand uh, accountability issues. And we believe that both internal and external accountability is very important. Uh, we have also uh, working very closely with the ODPP and IPOA, and we have uh, standard operating procedures on investigating uh, serious, uh, serious human rights violations. And this is important because we believe that if we work together in a multi-agency way, and I think this is one of the things that I have seen personally, because even after the Human Rights Watch report, when we went to the ground as Internal Affairs Unit to do investigations, we really had a difficult time because now you're coming, you're Internal Affairs Unit, you're from the police service, but we believe that if we're able to work with the civil society, if we're able to work with the uh, community-based organizations, we will work together and we'll be able to maybe get trust from the survivors and at least we are, going, we are able to do our investigations well. Now, uh, the other thing that we are also focusing on is training of, of not just uh, NPS officers, but also the Internal Affairs Unit, because we realize that this is a specialized area, like we have had when we say men in uniform, and, and of course the, the legal framework in our country that requires that sometimes you need to more evidence, although that is something that we are, we are debating, but we need uh, specialized skills training training skills for our officers, and it's an area that we are really dwelling on, ensuring that we have uh, that kind of training. So uh, I think even as I end, I think the message for us is that we are really committed. This is our country. Uh, when Just read, recently to the accounts from the survivors, it's really, really painful when we hear this that is happening in our country. And it can happen to anybody. It can happen to, to all of us. And we really have to stand. And I think the, the thing is every institution has to do its best. I was surprised because I was also expecting to see many police officers also represented here so that they can get this message. You know, sometimes when we have just reports, but it's good to come here and see the faces behind those reports and listen to these stories and shed a tear or two, even as a police officer. So maybe just to the organizers, next time bring about more police officers. Let the office of the Inspector General participate here. Let all those officers and the police officers come in. Even I think this local, we have the Kasarani police station. Even the OCS probably should have been here just maybe listening. But I think uh, what we are saying is from these reports, we are looking back but also we are learning these lessons and saying, what can we do better next time? So Internal Affairs Unit, uh, Mr. Amin would have wanted to be here. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to, but uh, be assured of his commitment and that of the National Police Service. In fact, we have uh, an elections committee that is even meeting up, uh, from tomorrow. I was just sharing from tomorrow. And one of the things that we have identified is uh, sexual violence related to elections. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we've taken note of your request. And also, I think uh, as you, with, within that committee, we'd want uh, love that civil society organizations are also represented so that we can work closely to just ensure that uh, there's no repeat of, of, of what was witnessed in previous elections. Quickly, I'll move to uh, Ms. Angelina Gikanda. Ms. Angelina is from CREW. Please share with us uh, your quick... Um, um, insights around this discussion. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think for, for us, just to echo the sentiments expressed uh, here in this table, that indeed uh, it's about time that uh, we acted differently. It's worrying that we haven't seen much action that would give us you know, uh, the strength to believe and trust that all will be well. The signs are out there. 
And so one of the things we are also looking forward to is that the report tells us that we need to act. But more importantly, how do we prevent it from happening? It's very sad that every other election, we have to pick the issues after the fact. We have to look, get, get to express the sentiments from the survivors who at that time are in pain and the journey of recovery is very uh, long. As Jackie said, it's 14 years, but you can still feel the pain that it has taken all the, this while and you're still seeking justice. We have seen some interesting you know, action by, for example, the police. And our hope and prayer is that it will stop being uh, good things on paper. It will stop being good commitments in public spaces, that it is action that is actually experienced out there when you go for elections. From the politicians will be running for office because we've already seen enough of them intimidated and sexual violence is used to intimidate. Most of them even not to run for office. We have seen it being used to intimidate the elected not to try and vote in a certain way. You're already hearing the cases of FGM forced on communities simply to intimidate them in one way or the other. Our prayer is that the duty bearers will do their due diligence and follow through on those cases because only when people see the consequences, only when we all work together uh, concertedly to look at these issues more in depth and address the root causes, will we be able to make sure we have safer communities and societies out here. As civil society, we pledge to do our bit. We'll set up the platforms. As crew, I know we'll have the hotline available. But what we want to do is let's avoid picking people at the end of the day. Can we try and prevent the violence? We've had the judiciary telling us about uh, alternative justice system that they want to employ. Our question is, is sexual violence part of that? Because we don't want to see crime being watered down in the name of mediations and negotiated uh, you know, settlements that actually do, are not survivor centered. They leave the, the survivors worse than where they were. Uh, we are also looking forward to the health sector doing their duty because those are spaces of safety. But in previous elections, they have been closed down, especially around election time. We've seen people being moved out of hospitals and being forced simply first to vote in order to get medical services. We are praying that in this election, that does not become a reality. The majority of those who suffer are women and girls. We are praying that they'll be safeguarded by the duty bearers and that everybody take responsibility because truth to civil society life and journey, we will be back after this election. We'll hold everybody to account. What did we do well? What did we do wrong? And areas of improvement. The political parties are critical. Indeed, we are hoping that this time around, they'll also be held to account as they send their team, uh, their the members out there, who are they sending to the community? How are the campaigns going on? We've also seen politicians who are using you know, their bodies for political office. The question is who holds them to account? We can only do so much as civil society. We don't have the resources to cover the entire country. And therefore our call is that duty bearers given the resources and that this is our money as taxpayers that we give to duty bearers to do this service. Then please let's have the service because indeed we'll be back, we'll give the report, and our prayer is that it will be a different scenario than what we've seen and the presentations made in the report today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Esther. Thank you, Agatha. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Daisy. Angeline, thank you. Thank you so much. We really take um, um, your views. Um, we'll put them into consideration and just ensure that we work closely to ensure that uh, we advance uh, this work the next um, level. Asante ni sana. Hey, I'm being requested here to allow IBC to respond to Daisy's concerns. I'll give you how many minutes? Two? Yes, two minutes, please. Okay, thank you. There were questions and concerns that were asked about IBC. One was the uh, party primaries and the two third, how we are um, ensuring that this is done. Yes, of course, uh, it is our mandate. And uh, with the political parties, because they're the ones that handle party plenaries, uh, we've, been having, we've been having meetings with the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties and the Political Parties Liaison Committee. And uh, in these meetings, we've been uh, meeting together so that they understand the rules of the game. IBC is the referee but the players belong to the political parties and also independent candidates. 
So we've been meeting with these critical uh, stakeholders and uh, we have the enforcement of two third gender role. Last year, you remember when they were submitting their nomination rules to IEBC and uh, all of them kept to the deadline, but no one had complied. And I want to remind you that as IBC, we stood up and told them that look here, in this country, there is no political party who has abided with the nomination rules that is expected of them. And that is one thing. When a commission can speak out and tell the country the truth as it is, that no one has uh, complied to the rules. So this one sent... Uh, bad airs to the political parties and we convened together and we showed them where they are. Uh, areas that uh, they didn't comply were these ones that we are talking about. So because IBC, we are supposed to be facilitative in our administration so that uh, no one who wants to vie for political seat feels infringed. So we had meetings with them. We created a help desk where we helped the political parties to abide to each and every rule that was stipulated. So by the end of the day, come December, all the 83 political parties have now um, complied with the nomination rules. So as Kenya, we are good to go. It is this nomination rules that now IBC, we will hold a stick on them as they move into the campaigns. A critical season is coming that IBC by law will gazette the election date. We all know that is the second Tuesday of, but by law, IBC has to gazette it. So what does this mean? It means that this is the time that party plenaries can start. Okay. It also means that this is the time that IBC will have the teeth to bite by law. All this time, it's not electioneering time, but once we gazette the debt, now we have the teeth to bite. There is what we call the Election Code of Conduct and Enforcement Committee. So it comes alive at that moment. So every query that comes to IBC these people will be called and um, they'll be summoned and they'll be listened to and charge sheets are going to be done against them and even disqualification. So that is how things are run at IBC. Um, campaign financing, uh, you all know that IBC does not make uh, laws in this country. We just uh, do the drafting and we input our, our experiences into them and take them to parliament. So this is the responsibility of parliament. So the Campaign Financing Act was shelved. Um, there's a question of online violence that is so much against women. So uh, we have uh, our social media pages that you can report. We'll also put an online a number, a hotline that you can report. But uh, up and above, we have our sister agencies and commissions that deal with that. So we are working together in this multi-agency uh, group that I talked about, the ASAP, Election Security Arrangement Program, that because we are not the ones that offer security, but we are keen to ensure that there is no intimidation and violence in elections. So we work with the people that offer these services. So uh, Kenyans, you're going to be uh, served well this time around. We are all Kenyans. We don't want to die because of election. We have children in this country. And this is our country. So even as much as I'm IBC, uh, the referee, I will not want to see the players killing themselves. I don't want to see the voters who are the spectators, yes, killing themselves. So we are part in this, and let's join our hands together and do this together. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, that's, as I'd said earlier, we are uh, out of time. So we'll quickly move to the next uh, agenda.
which is a brief on Angaza, going to details what, of, of what Angaza is. Um, the movement is all about fostering electoral integrity and transforming political leadership uh, in Kenya. So Madam Be will uh, give us a brief of the same. And uh, as she does so, she'll be looking at violence monitoring and also early warning uh, plan as a movement. Karibu Beti. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I know that time is running and be brief. Uh, but then I remember speaking with Madam Juliana, telling her, we are here talking about something so weighty. We have included it in an even more weightier document that actually captures the journeys of survivors. So important. Rarely read, rarely spoken, rarely captured. And we're asking ourselves, we are now again moving to an election in a couple of months, and we're sitting here asking ourselves, what is it that we have done that shows that we are actually serious to put an end to gender-based violence? And the reality and the fact is, we are where we are when we were there in 2007. Why do I say that? I think we are aware of what has been going on in the past two weeks. This conversation around Madoa Doa, doesn't it give you the chills? The idea that somebody has a right over where you belong because of your political affiliation, your identity, your gender, and your ethnicity. And somebody tells you, you either shut up and put up or toe the line. That is literally the political conversation that's going on. And the worst thing is, we're not hearing a sort of responding conversation that is saying this is absolutely nuts. Because whether we like it or not, we must accept that this government has also to deal with the massive entanglements that it's in. So where does that leave us? Because we're back again saying, do we just sit back and say, okay, I need to start moving like somebody advised on social media, wear an orange t-shirt, make sure that you've got, I don't know what colors, seeing the right tones. Why does anybody have to do that to be able to protect their lives? The reality is the state has a duty and responsibility to protect every single person's life. As enshrined in the Constitution, they're not favors, they're not privileges. They're rights as enshrined. And yet here we are, again, 2007, 2013, 2017, and now we're in 2022. And we're still talking about the same thing, justice, accountability, reparation, systems, resources, infrastructure, police reform. Those conversations we've been having, and it started the National Accord and Reconciliation Act. And it went into our katiba that we had. But we also know what happened after that. It has transitioned into something where we ask ourselves, which constitution are we talking about? The one of 2010, or the one that we have disseminated every single year for the past nine and a half years, so to speak. So, I know and I believe that this government has the potential to be able to put a stop to the violence. And I also know, just as everybody else knows here, that GBV is a human rights violation and therefore it should be punishable. The idea that women have to consistently justify that they've been violated is a dereliction for me on my part, on the state's part, to be able to show the urgency and the importance and even just to value what it is that women have gone through. In August, what, last year, between April and June, we saw an escalation of violence, not just for women, but even men. So when we start talking about early warning, we ask ourselves, what does early warning mean to you when you're in your county in Migori, or in Viga, or in Kisumu? Those of us who are here are working in the field of GBV. We know that you will walk into a police station and you'll be told you have to pay a thousand shillings. 
that you will walk in a hospital and you'll be told there are no reagents, that you'll be told you cannot go to court because we have not been able to get our forensic tests back. When we talk about early warning, it's not up there, it's down here. It is that you have nowhere to go because we do not have a safe house, a rescue, or a GBV center. It is that we are dealing with trauma and we don't have counselors because we haven't recruited, and if we have recruited, we have not paid. So we deal with trauma in the only way best we know. And unfortunately, most of it always ends up in suicide. That we are wondering how many cases in a month have we reported because we don't have a system that actually caps, captures the information. We have to ask ourselves, if as a county we are not prepared to handle the cases that we're reporting now, and we know that during elections, those cases triple times five, then how can we start talking about being prepared? Why is it that you will spend all this time to the police, training them, and then a month before election, you say you've been walking the journey with transferred. How are you prepared? The person you've been walking with who created a plan is no longer there. Oh yes, and I told that civil service can go anywhere. Perhaps the question we have to ask ourselves is, should we then be putting our foot down and saying, between for the election, nobody should be transferred. Neither should we accept anybody. Because how do we prepare with people who are not going to be there when you literally need them? Our early warning is asking us, what plan do we have in place in our counties? And remember, it is a county, even though it's a national headquarters. So we have 47 counties, but how prepared are we? What system exists that strengthens collaboration? The gender sector working group. The referral pathways, are they effective? For the past three years, most of these counties have refused to allocate any money, any money to do with issues around community awareness, education, and even just furnishing the structures that are put up that we call safe houses. Fact. So we in Angaza are saying, Angaza, which is a, con a consortium of civil society partners working across this country, is saying we've got to deal with issues around integrity. And please, integrity is not just about political leadership. Integrity is also about the professional who is sitting in an office that is employed by a county government office. That integrity is about a person who is in a position of power and is not able to fulfill their work. So we're asking ourselves, what do we do where we have incidences where something like that is not being dealt with? We propose to be able to set up a situation room. And this for us is how the situation room we propose is going to work. 47 counties need to be able to tell the situation room how prepared their respective counties are in terms of handling, in terms of dealing with issues around GBV. We will prepare a list that is given to actors who are working in the GBV sector and say, can you please update and say, how prepared are you as a county? Do you have a center? Do we have resources? Do we have personnel? Is there a reporting system in place? And if it isn't, it is our work, not just as a secretary, but as everybody, to be able to amplify the weaknesses that one is saying, one is able to say. Movement is that we're saying that elections have to be free and fair. Because it is only when we have got a safe environment that we women are able to participate in the vote, which is important, because we also want to choose the people that we want to be able to represent us. We also know that it is only when it's fair and free that we also avoid incidences of violence. But we also know that it is only when it is free and fair that the Electoral Commission is able to ensure that they enforce the rules that they were talking about. The second thing is about credibility. And for me, credibility is really very simple. We must be able to see how the state is acting on issues around impunity. And it cannot be 
that what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. And we have seen a system where because somebody belongs to so-and-so, they get a pass when they break exactly the same crime as somebody else. So credibility is about not applying any double standards. And we need to be able to point that out because this is what Angaza movement is talking about. We must be able to have a system that is able to behave fairly and equally, irrespective of who the person is. The other accountability, and in here we're looking at issues around the and the human rights-based organization. You know, I was listening to the panel that we just had, and I was talking with my, Madam Juliana, and I was asking myself, did we realize that we were all talking about my organization is doing this, I am going to be able to do this? We have to figure out how we're going to talk with each other, how we're going to add value to each other's work, how we're going to strengthen and collaborate with each other. That if IBC is talking about the new suggestions and recommendations they're putting in place to be able to address GBV, civil society should be able to say, we need to hold you accountable, give us a plan, and we have to monitor their action. If IPOA is talking about, for the first time, we're going to have some, some system or the other, we need to ask IPOA, so how are you linking up with civil society? Or how is civil society linking up with you? We have got to feed into each other's work because this, what we are talking about, GBV, cannot be handled by one person. And the idea behind building a movement is that we add value to each other person's work. We not only devolve it so that it is not a national activity, but it is operating even at the county level, whichever, irrespective of which county level it is, but that one can be able to escalate it into a larger voice, amplifying the issues that we think need to be put in place. Transparency, we're saying we cannot allow the government to be able to decide that because of their entanglement, that we are going to decide and pick and cherry pick what we can engage in and what we can't. I think we as women sitting here today and survivor groups have got to be able to demand in such a way that the government gets to listen. We can't be whispering anymore. We cannot be talking in, in low tones anymore. We must be able to shout. And the survivor groups that we have here have the capacity to be able to make sure that every single day your voices are heard. So Angaza movement is planning to be able to set up a Twitter handle. And I know that sounds really elitist because people do not have it. But we are asking ourselves, the social media platform in this country is one of the most misused, but also one of the most used. The survivor groups in this room as we're in are also on social media platform. Domesticating the media platform that you find accountable to be able to tag. And we tried it. That every single day, all the survivors in this country decide to only send one tweet. And if you're 10,000 people and you're retweeting and tagging only one person, that's loud enough. So shouting doesn't have to be in front of your TV or shouting on radio. Shouting can actually be through your phone in a way that your message is heard every single day. And if we have to send 10,000 messages every single day for the next six months, so be it. Because we said we are not going to keep quiet. And then, of course, finally, is the whole aspect around effective leadership. And the issue around elect, uh, uh, effective leadership here is identifying IBC at your respective counties, the police, looking at civil society partners who are there, the judiciary, and our county government. We cannot be in a place where, when we have violence, we have no access to a hospital. Or when we have violence and we go to a police station, we are told that you have a gender desk, that's all very nice, but the police station gates are locked. That we are no hurtling into this election, and yet we have not imagined that we should create safe corridors that people can be able to use. 
we must be able, we as women who are here, knowing exactly what goes on, we must be able to design our plan for our protection. Everybody designs the plan for you. Perhaps it's time for us to design our own plan and to present this plan and say, this is how I want you to protect me in this coming election. And we can have something that's done pre-primary nomination because we know how it is, post-primary nomination because we also know how that is going to turn out, pre-general election and post. By designing how we want to be protected, we then create a voice and say, we are part and parcel of ensuring that we maintain our security. So moving forward, what are we asking everybody? We are saying, and it is important first, that we have to encourage every single person for the simple reason being our vote matters because who it is that we put up. And yes, I've been watching everything that's going on and we have seen all these alliances and we have seen movements. We have seen marriages breaking apart and marriage being remade. But ultimately, I believe that we still have a role to play in determining who it is that we give the power to be able to rule, to be able to decide, to be able to plan, and to be able to work with us. And especially we women, because of what it means to us when there is a lack of safety, we have a bigger role to play. And I've seen everybody talking about voter apathy. What voter apathy is, is that it leaves us with no option but to be stuck with anything. The Angaza movement is talking about election integrity, but it's also talking about integrity of its leaders. The integrity of its leaders are choices that are made by those of us who are here today. So it is important that we engage in that electoral process because that electoral process is so important in determining what sort of future we want to be able to see. The second thing is that we must demand that the injustices of 2007, 2013, 2017 must be dealt with. We cannot be demanding for reparation until now. That just shows the level of disinterest that our state has. So we must be able to demand justice, accountability, and that accountability and the redress that we're talking about requires that we also commit the government to the obligation that it made. Agenda two of the National Accord, we shall, reset, we shall ensure that everybody is rehabilitated, and that we shall ensure that we are able to reparate. It is not us who are talking. It was signed by none other than the Kibaki, the former president, and Raila Odinga at that time. So we must demand, because of that uh, accord that was put in place, it binds the state every single election season that we have violence, we must resettle, we must rehabilitate, and we must be able to ensure that we repair. And that continues to be a clarion call that every single one of us must be able to make. And Angaza is going to be able to do that with the help of you. And then, of course, the other issue is ensuring that we put in place structures we cannot be talking about a gender sector working group that does not function, so we have to make sure that it works. We have been introduced to something called polycare, and we're told it's a pilot. We would like to have a pilot in more than one place. We can't be a country that has witnessed electoral violence every single cycle, and we only pilot in one place. The idea of polycare is really what civil society have been talking about as a one-stop shop. So yes, we are very happy that it's been put in place. Now we're demanding that in every single county, every single county, 47 counties, must be able to have their own polycare. Why? It will make data collection so much easier. It will make accountability so much more effective. It will ensure that survivors are protected. 
because it is a one-stop shop. And that is something that we must be able to lobby for. Finally, I can't believe that we are still talking about P3 reform being one thousand four. During election violence, you don't have a penny. If there's anything that COVID has done, it has completely wiped out our own assets. That we now have a choice between justice and our survival and our family. We have got to have a government policy that is clear, that states that P3 forms are free. And in the event that we find anybody selling it, we must have clear statements as to what action must be taken. Clear. That's what accountability is. That's what credibility is. That's what leadership is that we're talking about. And finally, that's what fairness is. So we've started a journey, a movement that we're calling Angaza. But Angaza really is not just a few people who have ruled it out. Angaza is every single one of us who are here. We all want to see change, and therefore we are all partners in ensuring that that change happens. So as we continue to roll it out, as we establish the situation room, we're hoping that that will be a tool that will be used to consistently amplify and monitor government action. But that as you go back to your respective counties, we ask for one thing. Sit down and plan. How do you want to be protected? And if you develop your protection tool, we present it to our respective county governors. We amplify it because it is only from there that we will start monitoring the extent to which our counties are prepared to be able to protect us before the election. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betty, for such an elaborate plan uh, by the Angaza movement uh, in ensuring that uh, we deal with the critical issues as we progress uh, within our movement's objective. So the moment we've all been waiting for is here. We are now ready and set to launch the report. So I, I know there will be a vote of thanks, definitely. But I just want to say as we put this together, this report will not have been possible without the support of one, Anne Sabania. Please, Anne, say hi to your people. It is because of you that this report started and we got something to tell the world that indeed women of Kenya from Migori, Vihiga, and Kisumu demand justice. Kweli si kweli. Yes. Please say hi to the people. Good afternoon once again. Yes, I am indeed honored to be part of this process. Uh, and it is a process that was quite uh, intensive, uh, very sensitive, because you're talking to someone who has gone through a uh, very intensive, you know, the worst form of violence that a woman would ever experience, you know, abusing the core of femininity, you know, touching on the very important part that makes us women. And not so in, in a consensual process, but in a forced manner. So as we did this uh, data collection, uh, I lent the team and I can attest to the truth that the, the, the report that you've received here is as a result of visiting homesteads of women uh, together with their households. Some of the interviews were done in the midst of the immediate caregiver, like um, a wife and a husband. Um, now I take this opportunity to officially launch the report on sexual violence as a political tool during elections in Kenya. State agents need 
needed ahead of 2022 general election. Continue. Continue. The justice be our shield and defender. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I think uh, also the victims are holding the record. Yes. 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 Sorry, sorry, survivors. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, cameras. Turn. Take around. Turn. More power to survivors. More power. More power. 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 More power. more power. More power to survivors, more power. More power to survivors, more power. More power. More agency to survivors, more agency. More agency. We want you to be speaking on your on your behalf. Munajongelea, jinyo wenyewe. So we'll empower you towards that with all these partners. Yes. 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 Yeah, but we don't hope to have more survivors moving forward. Yes. Yes. Because we are putting this situation into permanent end. Yes, good afternoon. I'll do a very quick vote of thanks. Very, um, very quick because I think it's 2 p.m. Yeah. So to begin with, I want to thank all of you for making it to this um, forum. Very, very useful. We have a very sobering report and we are hoping that um, it, it helps us to prepare better for what we can expect could happen and therefore to be more vigilant, to, to come together more and, and see what um, concerted efforts really we need to bring together so that 2022 uh, does not reflect as the other elections have. So I will single out some of the people who have uh, made it very successful. Thank you very much, Commissioner Juliana, representing the IEBC. We are very honored that you could make it uh, here. Uh, Madam Juliana is being thanked. She's, uh, being, <laughs> she's being told that Madam Juliana is being thanked. Yes, thank you for, for honoring us with your presence because we cannot do this without the IBC. You are a critical stakeholder in any election conversation. So we are really happy that you could make it. Um, Madam Malamba from the GEC. Thank you so much for coming uh, to, to the meeting. Mary Kinari, Daktari, uh, where are you seated? Yeah, I was trying to, uh, she left already. Yeah, she was representing the, the CAJ and we are happy that uh, she could make it. Buana Evans Okeo, who was representing IPOA. Thank you very much for, for coming. Of course, Jackie, thank you for sharing your story very powerfully, Asante Sana. And I mean, the pain of 14 years can be felt. 14 years later, it can still be felt. Thank you for reminding us that uh, victi victims are in the morgue and we have survivors and survivors have agency and they can speak for themselves. We thank Lee Fang who has already left. She was representing the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Thank you, um, representatives from FIDA, CRU, Crown Trust. Um, we thank the representative from ELOG, of course, the Office of the ODPP, the Internal uh, Affairs Unit. All of you made it really, I mean, thank you for coming because you have given your voice, you have given the commitments 
that we need moving forward to the 2022 elections. So we will remember to come back to the commitments that you have made. Uh, Madam Juliana, we will remember that uh, there were commitments today, and so we will uh, be careful to hold you to account against the word you have made today. Thank you very much to our online participants. We are happy that you stayed on. Thank you very much. Thank you to the FIDH for the partnership um, in documenting this and, of course, getting it published. We thank Anne Sabania, the consultant who was leading this work. We are grateful that uh, finally the report has seen the light of day. It may appear like it delayed, but I couldn't think of a better time to launch the report. I think now that elections are only a couple of months away, this is a very timely conversation because we must talk about this kind of violence. It's not unique to 2017. We saw in the 2007 elections where over 900 cases were documented. So it's a trend and, and therefore really uh, state instigated uh, sexual violence. So it is a very timely conversation. I thank all of you and especially also my colleagues at the KHRC led by Soila, Annette, and the other team members, Davis Malombe, for steering all of us in this process. Asante Nisana, because it is your effort that makes us gather here today. Thank you very much.